Good afternoon to all of our students, families, and staff. Thank you for joining us at our virtual board meeting on this day, Tuesday, October the 27th, 2020. We hope that you all are continue, continuing to remain safe and healthy. Although we are conducting our, our meeting via Zoom conference today due to the continued guidelines associated with the pandemic, the meeting is being um, live streamed on our website as well as you can go to MCPS TV. We have also provided a phone number for the public to use to join the meeting. Um, just know that it will be muted to keep out any background noise. This meeting is only focused on essential business items and live public comments have been suspended. Um, so I will now take the role of all the board members and just um, let us know that you're present. I'll start with Vice President Wolf. I'm here. Mr. Asante. Here. Dixon. Here. Good afternoon, everyone. Dr. Gatha. Here. Mrs. O'Neill. Here. Ms. Silvestre. Here. Mrs. Smogroski. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm here. Okay. As and I want to remind everybody to vote. Okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm acknowledging that we have a quorum. And um, board members, I will call on you one at a, at a time to ask questions and circle back around if you have any additional questions. At this time, I can get approval of the agenda. Move approval. Second. It's been moved and seconded. And I also wanted to make certain that I acknowledge our superintendent. He is here along with um, staff. And Dr. Smith, I didn't know if you had. If I think I'm ready to begin. Good okay, afternoon, let's everyone. Go ahead. Let's go ahead. And so we will go to item three on the agenda, recognitions. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Today we have two recognitions. First of all, Native American Heritage Month and Day. During National Native American Heritage Month and Day, we celebrate the traditions, languages, and stories of the first Americans who have helped shape the future of the United States throughout its history. In 1986, the United States Congress passed a law to authorize and request the president to make a proclamation recognizing Native Americans as the first inhabitants of this country and the contributions they have made to medicine, literature, arts, sports, and infrastructure. In 1990, a joint resolution was approved to designate the month of November as Native American Heritage Month. Native American Heritage Month serves as an opportunity to celebrate the rich and diverse cultures, traditions, and histories of Native Americans, as well as to educate and raise awareness of the many tribes, their geographic locations and languages, as well as the unique challenges that Native people have faced in the past and continue to face to this day, and how tribal citizens have worked to conquer those challenges. We recognize notable Native American achievements throughout this country's history. Caleb Chishatomic of the Wapanoag Nation became the first Native American to graduate from Harvard University in 1665. The Cherokee Phoenix became the first Native American newspaper and the first newspaper written in the indigenous language in 1828. Hiram Rhodes Revels of the Lumbee Nation became the first Native American elected to the U.S. Senate in 1870. Bessie Coleman of the Cherokee Nation became the first Native American woman pilot in 1921. Charles D. Curtis of the Kaw and Osage Nations became the first Native American to serve as U.S. Vice President in 1929. KNDM AM became the first radio station to broadcast primarily in the Navajo language in 1957 and continues to broadcast to this day. Linda K. Hogan of the Chickasaw Nation became the first Native American nominated as a U.S. Poet Laureate in 2010. Kimberly Teehee became the first delegate to the United States House of Representatives from the Cherokee Nation in 2019. We recognize the many outstanding achievements of this country's native people and their descendant and their descendants, while also maintaining a steadfast steadfast voice against the social injustices perpetrated against the original inhabitants of this country. Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools hereby declare the month of November 
2020 to be observed as Native American Heritage Month in Montgomery County Public Schools, and that Friday, November 27, 2020, be observed as Native American Heritage Day. Move approval. Second. Mr. Move and second it. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. We also want to uh, recognize today the upcoming National School Psychology Week. The National Association of School Psychologists has designated November 9th through 13, 2020 as National School Psychology Week to recognize the important work of school psychologists to support student learning and well-being. The theme for this year's National School Psychology Week is the power of possibility. The word possibility implies hope, growth, resilience, and renewal. Possibility suggests that even something as small as a seed can grow into something magnificent. The word power implies that things can and will happen. When we, foc when we focus on what is possible, we have hope that students will grow, thrive, and bloom. School psychologists and school staff may empower students to grow in areas such as social skills, empathy, compassion for others, as well as individual or interpersonal skills, such as problem solving, goal setting, and study skills. School psychologists assist students and staff in seeing possibilities and developing positive change to thrive in schools and life. Additionally, school psychologists and school staff may be empowered to move toward positive change in all areas of leadership in the counseling room, the classroom, the community, and beyond. It is appropriate that Montgomery County Public Schools recognize the critical role of school psychologists Therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Montgomery County Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools hereby proclaim November 9 through 13, 2020 as National School Psychology Week in Montgomery County Public Schools and recommend observance by all of our school communities. Move approval. Second. We'll move and second it. All in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. So at this time, we move to item four. The next item on our agenda is public comments. Given that we are conducting our meeting virtually, we ask the public to submit their testimony in a variety of ways. They can sit it in written form, video or audio, and um, public comments can be um, can be pulled from board docs for anyone who wants to view that. But public comments is an opportunity for us to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it's not our practice to take any action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address the specific, my goodness, I can't even talk today, specific employee or student um, matter. So we encourage you to utilize the proper avenues of redress for the complaints. So check our website for any updates to our meeting start times, work sessions, and any other changes. And at this time, I just will let you know we have received three written testimonies for today. And um, as mentioned, you can get that on board docs. And here's a summary of the written testimonies. Olga Shans. Ms. Shans is an MCPS parent who advocates for the return to in-person learning. She cites to state she cites to state guidelines, a Brown University study and a statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics to support her position that students should be physically present in schools. Christy Garot, um, she is the parent of a second grader at Rockwell Elementary School. She advocates for the safe, immediate return to in-person instruction. She cites to CDC guidelines and believes there is no, no scientific evidence to support continued online learning. She also shares her ideas about standards that MCPS can implement in order to keep students and teachers safe upon returning to the classroom. Hannah Solomon is an MCPS middle school student who believes that Wi-Fi is not safe. She cites to the World Health Organization and the United Nations to support her position. Hannah requests that MCPS provide hardware like ethernet wires because she believes these things would protect students' health. We have um, video testimony, 12 to be exact. And right now the first up is David King. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith, Dr. McKnight, Board President Evans and members of the Board of Education. My name is David King and I'm a senior at Walter Johnson High School. 
I've spoken to you before about my concerns revolving around mental health and the grading system in our virtual learning model, and today those concerns are more pressing than ever. At the board's community stakeholder conversation last week, Derek Turner presented several preliminary yet terrifying data points that have been coming out of the surveys that MSPS has been pushing out to students, teachers, and staff. I don't have much time here, so I'm going to try to hit the highlights quickly. Almost 60% of students reported that uh, schools have provided a neutral or dissatisfactory level of support for their social emotional needs. And over 40% of students have said that online learning has had an outright negative impact on their mental health. In addition, almost 40% of students have said that they feel not at all connected in any way to their fellow students. Alongside these concerns about mental health, instruction hasn't been happening properly either. Some 45% of teachers have said that they cannot adequately provide for the individual needs of students. About 36% of parents have said that at least at times their students have no idea what they're supposed to be doing. And obviously we have massive difficulties with technology as well. I've already proposed to you a simple systemic reform to Canvas that I think would address several of these needs and I hope you'll still adopt it. But it's very obvious that we need to take this conversation several steps further. What this boils down to is something that we all already knew. Online learning is not an adequate replacement for traditional instruction in any way, shape, or form. And yet, you continue as you have from the very beginning to decry systemic reforms here as unnecessary. If you don't want to listen to my facts, then fine. These are yours. It's time to shake up the model here. This isn't working. Your Be Well 365 initiative cannot be capped at bi-weekly lessons or my homeroom teacher, a complete stranger, tells me that all of my problems will go away if I can learn how to take deep breaths and get more sleep. Right now, counselors are wholly inaccessible to students, teachers are unavailable to provide additional assistance, and administration is completely unresponsive to the needs of the students. We are suffering in your system. Now again, I don't presume to be knowledgeable enough to provide outright recommendations for how to address grading reform and student mental health. But we're being asked to learn an entire normal year's worth of content, virtually apart from our friends in about half the class time, which is unfair and punishing to students. You've already developed several possible reforms to the grading plan for the spring semester. It is far past time to reinvestigate and adopt one or more of those as a literal baseline for the reforms that need to be undertaken this year. It is far past time for us to reapproach this school year with a much greater emphasis on student mental health. Decrease workloads, make counselors and psychologists available, reorganize Canvas, eliminate our frustration, communicate your plans and workings to us better, and start looking for even bigger ways to reform this system for the sake of protecting your students. Thank you for your time. The health and safety of your students lies in your hands. Thank you. At this time, the next video, we will hear from Ashley Daugherty. Good afternoon. My name is Ashley Doherty, and I have a third and fifth grader in MCPS. I am advocating for a prompt return to schools for many reasons, but most importantly and most pressing is the impact virtual learning is having on their mental health. It is ironic to me that in this very meeting, you've touched on the upcoming National School Psychology Week, yet have a complete disregard for the mental health of our young students. We are lucky to be at a school with an amazingly supportive group of teachers and administrative staff. But what is happening to my son in particular cannot be fixed by a Zoom meeting or an email. He has social interactions through sports and sometimes even with friends, but to pretend that any of that is an adequate substitute for being in the classroom with peers he knows, to touch assignments and see teachers, to be away from the environment in which he has been trapped for the last 228 days is outrageous and ignorant. You have taken developing children and complicated their worlds to a point that has exacerbated any underlying issues. This is not a problem that's affecting a disadvantaged population. It's not a problem the virus has caused. This is a problem without an age, a color, or a political affiliation. This is a problem that you have created with your lack of action. Don't tell me you could look my son in the eyes and tell him his mental health matters to you, because even he knows that's not true. You spend meeting after meeting congratulating each other and talking in circles, and I spend meeting after meeting reading and listening and watching for some sign that you're actually doing something and that that something is with the well-being of our children in mind, but no. And while you're patting each other on the back, 
Our children are in their beds and their basements and their back seats trying to develop into something better than they were in the spring and they're failing. Your complacency in inaction and getting them back to the school building has created widespread apathy in young children. It is dangerous and it must be addressed. You boast about following health recommendations of leadership and basing your decisions on science, but now that those recommendations and scientific metrics are in favor of a return, you point fingers, you sit on your hands, and you are paralyzed with fear. You have relinquished all decision-making to Dr. Gales. It is time for you to stand up for the population you're here to serve and protect, the students. We are not scared of sending our children back. We know it can be and will be done in a safe way. We're scared of keeping them home any longer. Our home is loving and supportive and open. I changed my career path when my son was born to be able to be with him at home when necessary. However, not having a school building, a community outside of his family is harming him significantly and it is not necessary. I know at your core, all of you love these children. I know that. But you talk about their health and safety in every meeting and never acknowledge their mental health and safety. When will that be the conversation? When will that matter? When will you actually put the children first? Please take action to bring these students back to the school building. Take the steps and spend the money to do it safely for them and for the teachers. But do it soon. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Carrie Dingle. Hi, my name is Carrie Dingle. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. I'm here to urge the board to set forth a concrete, science-driven, and achievable plan for immediately returning at least some students to classrooms. I'm a room parent for my son's kindergarten class at Sligo Creek Elementary School. Despite the tremendous efforts of his teacher, virtual learning is not working for him. At five, he's expected to navigate multiple online platforms, despite the fact that he can barely read and has never used a computer before. He's expected to pay attention to a screen for hours at a time with breaks that are far too brief. The virtual format is developmentally inappropriate and he gets lost and distracted easily. I'm afraid he's learning that school is boring and frustrating and I can see him learning to tune it out and pretend he doesn't care. I wonder every day if kindergarten is doing more harm than good and I've heard similar things from many other parents. The enrollment numbers reflect that many parents have already decided it's not worth it, yet this widespread reality has never really been acknowledged, let alone adequately addressed by the board. Sadly, I think the true costs of virtual learning run much deeper than my personal frustration. ProPublica has laid out research showing the disparate impact of remote learning on poor students. There are many young students who don't have the constant attention of an adult. Uh, that's required throughout the day to assist with technical issues or help them find the correct materials. There are students who return to their uh, classes after lunch hungry because no one was available to make them lunch in the middle of the day. And there are many parents, mostly moms, who have had to leave or cut back on their jobs to ensure that their kids had a safe place to be during the day. Now, we know that this is happening. No one can say that returning kids to school is without risk. But the board must recognize and take into account the risk of continuing in a virtual only format. Now, I personally believe strongly in public education. I think it's foundational for a functioning democracy. But the board's actions are strangling any hope of a competitive public option in this county, potentially for years to come. And I think that's disgraceful for a county with so much wealth and so many resources to draw on. Now, I'm lucky because I could send my kids to private school or move if we needed to, but many people don't realistically have those options, and I do not want to give up on public school. Finally, I just want to note um, that as the pandemic was emerging, I thought it was reasonable for the board to be cautious and focus on keeping students and staff safe while assessing the risk. But there's significant data from the last eight months that shows that in-person education can be done safely. Just to give one of many examples, a story featured on NPR last Wednesday suggested that the risks of reopening are exaggerated and summarized numerous studies that showed no consistent relationship between in-person K-12 school and the spread of coronavirus, as well as no elevated risk to childcare workers working in person with children. There's also robust data from the National COVID-19 School Response Dashboard showing that school reopening across the country has not led to community spread. 
The board has had nearly eight months to gather information, produce a plan, and implement safety protocols that allow students to begin to return to school in a safe way. Many districts across the country have already done this, despite coronavirus case metrics that are no better than Montgomery counties. I urge the board to follow their lead instead of abdicating its responsibility to educate our children. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Tracy Link and Nicholas Link. Thank you, MCPS Board of Education, for allowing me this opportunity to speak today. My name is Nicholas Link, and I'm begging you to open up in-person school. I used to enjoy going to school because there's a lot more to school than learning. I would see lots of people, and now you cannot see anyone. If I were at school, I would see people I'm friends with but don't really see out of school. I'm missing out on building these relationships with these people. For me, online school is a huge disappointment. It is very repetitive and boring because I basically only get two assignments per class each week, and all I have to do is complete them before Sunday night. I'm glad things are easy because I'm maintaining good grades, but I know I'm not being challenged and I wonder how this is going to help me when I get to college. I'm a visual learner and I work better if I see what the teacher is actually doing in front of the classroom. I'm also missing out on developing these relationships with my teachers, which I have not yet, which I have not really been able to do online. In real life class, usually when you're confused, you can see your peers being confused alongside you and your teacher can recognize your expressions and further explain whatever you're supposed to be learning. I play two sports at school. Not having these is a big deal because I work much better in life under a busy schedule and that is not happening now. We are missing out on so many regular school events and social clubs that we will never get back. Some of which include friends that I have not yet been able to see since March 13th. My mental health is okay now, but last year when actual quarantine began, I could not function because I could not do anything during lockdown. I've learned how to work around that now. I play basketball with my neighborhood friends almost every day. To cope with this last year, I went to my grandma's house and practically did no work. When I came home, I finished all of two weeks worth of work in just a few hours. The schedule now is better, but I could still take advantage. If we were in school, we, are, we would be responsible enough to follow the guidelines to wear masks and social distance. I don't think following these rules would be a big deal because seeing people and teachers would be a big enough positive to follow the rules. Please open schools. Thank you. My name is Tracy Link and I'm the parent of three children. You just heard from my middle child. My oldest virtually graduated last May and my daughter is in eighth grade. I am here today to implore you to open up in-person schools. The American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC are both in agreement with the goal of having students physically in schools. New studies show that schools are not super spreader environments. We need concrete and manageable plans ASAP. I speak for many families whose kids are feeling isolated and alone. Kids are not meant to be on a computer all day long. Many people cannot just opt out and attend in-person private schools or homeschool. We, they, rely on the public school system to educate our children. The kids are lost and unknown among a sea of blank Zoom profiles. The actual learning is flat, even with the teacher's best intentions. But sitting in one seat all day watching a computer screen is not conducive to interactive demonstrative learning. The learning loss is unimaginable. The Center for Research and Education Outcomes at the Stanford University released a report on October 1st dealing with estimated learning loss. The key takeaway is chilling. The recovery from losses could take years to make up. How many kids have failing grades as compared to last year at this time? How many of those are minorities or English language learners? MCPS talks about equity, but how equitable is virtual learning? The divide between the haves and the have-nots is growing with the use of learning pods, private tutors, and switching schools for those that can, and those that cannot are just left struggling. How can a teacher provide feedback for 76 students? And yes, my daughter has 76 kids in her honors history class with one teacher and one paraeducator. 76. An infectious disease expert at Boston University, Dr. Jenkins, states, quote, children are not being prioritized and they're missing out on all the positive things about going to school. I don't understand why we're not as a community getting together and deciding that schools need to be a priority and making them as safe as we can, end quote. Are we repurposing school staff, building personnel, athletic directors, security, central office staff to reopen a working plan, all of these people should be working on implementing plans. MCPS should be leading the way, not sitting idly by with no concrete action plan. What is the end game here? It appears from all experts that COVID is here for the long haul, and we cannot go months or years without our kids in school. Waiting for zero cases or widespread vaccinations is just not realistic. Please open up in-person school. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Lori Trent. Good evening. My name is Lori Trent, and I am here to discuss how the inaction of Montgomery County Public Schools Board of Education has caused this mother to be separated from her child. These are the points that I'm going to touch on. How the absence of a plan impacts real families. About the abdication of leadership and elected duties. 
and following the data and science to come up with a plan to reopen schools. My son's name is Jacob and tonight, October 25th, is going to be the last night he's going to sleep under my roof. Jacob's father and I recently made the heartbreaking decision to send our only child, this fun-loving boy of 15 years old, to go live with my sister in Arizona to get face-to-face -face schooling, to get a real education. You must know how painful the next several months will be as I live apart from him during these formative time in his life. They are months that we will never get back as a family. His father and I felt that we needed to make this Judgment of Solomon-like decision, sacrific sacrificing our, our own joy as parents for his well-being. As documented recently on our local Fox affiliate, Fox 5, my son's grades were slipping. He was not learning. His mental health was starting to decline. This has a real impact um, and has caused his parents to make decisions that no parent should have to make. The Montgomery County Public School Board of Education has abdicated its responsibility as a leader, has abandoned its mission and its students with the absence of a plan. As I prepared for this testimony, I started with the Board of Education website and pulled one of your core values. I'm going to read it now. Learning. We believe that we must engage every student every day. Learning is achieved by cultivating curiosity and encouraging determination, focus, and hard work. And adult learning engagement are keys to student learning. Therefore, we will encourage and support critical thinking, problem solving, active questioning, risk taking, to continuously approve, stimulate, discover by engaging students in relevant, rigorous, academic, social, and emotional learning experiences to challenge ourselves and analyze and reflect upon evidence to improve our practices. Are you, the Montgomery County Public Montgomery, Montgomery County Public School Board, are you following your own core values? Encouraging determination, focus and hard work, critical thinking, risk taking to continually improve, problem solving to challenge ourselves, analyze and reflect upon evidence to improve our practices. Ask yourselves how one of the most wealthy, educated counties, the 15th largest school district in the United States, in the seat of one of the most powerful communities on earth, does not have a plan. Ask yourself as of today, with the COVID numbers being at 2.7% test positivity and a seven day rolling average of 9.4% per 100,000 people and still not have a plan. Yes, it will be hard work and require steps never taken before. But in the DC area, we should be leading, not sitting back and watching districts like New York, Florida, and Utah taking the lead. We want, state, we want students to be safe. We want our kids to be safe. And we also want teachers and administrators to be safe. But most importantly for me, I wanna bring my son home so I can mother him as any mother should. Thank you and have a nice evening. Next, we will hear from Theodora Scarato. When children go back to school, the technology in the classrooms should be safe, wired, not wireless technology. The Palo Alto PTA recently released an infographic on safer ways to use computers. It talks about using a hardwired connection, keeping a distance from the router because routers emit radio frequency radiation just like Wi-Fi computers do. Many teacher unions have taken action on the issue of radio frequency radiation, wireless in the classrooms, and especially to protect teachers. The United Educators of San Francisco in 2018 actually passed a resolution on safer technology um, calling for consideration that the California Department of Health cell phone advisory, it describes how to reduce exposure to your cell phone, that that be disseminated among all teachers and staff and, and students and actually be in every classroom. I did a webinar with Dr. Cindy Russell of Physicians for Safe Technology for UESF teachers 
features on enhancing technology safety in schools, and you can watch that online. The New York State Teachers Union in 2014 actually did a press release on best practices for schools. They have guidelines for safer use of wireless technology that was developed for them. There even was a web webinar with Dr. Magda Havas. It is on their website, and it's on the risk of wireless technologies and protecting children and staff in schools. I'd like to read you what Paul Pecoral, Vice President of the New York State United Teachers Union, stated. We have enough evidence to justify taking action, and we're not willing to wait until our members, their children, and the students suffer health consequences from not doing anything. Children are more vulnerable because they have smaller heads, thinner skulls, they have a rapidly developing brain, so they absorb more wireless radiation compared to adults. However, this is really a teacher health issue as well because they are working and don't have control over the electromagnetic environment. In fact, they haven't even been informed and they are not aware that wireless signals have been found to cause harm in many, many studies. And these studies are currently being ignored by the U.S. government. That is why Environmental Health Trust is actually part of a historic legal action against the Federal Communications Commission on this issue. In fact, in our case, I specifically referenced the letter to Montgomery County Schools, of which I have sent you again, because the FCC says that federal agencies are in agreement that there's no problem with the wireless radiation limits that we have, when in fact, these agencies have not reviewed the science. So ask your Yourself, whenever have regulations been in step with reality, especially when it comes to environmental health exposures where there are companies with billions of dollars at stake. Please learn more about this issue. I am absolutely available. I live right here in Montgomery County, and I'm glad to give you a full presentation on this issue. Next, we will hear from Dana Graham. Good afternoon, Dr. Smith. Board President Evans, and members of the board. My name is Danny Graham, and I'm a senior at Montgomery Blair High School. Today, I wanted to talk to you about the successes and failures of online learning, as well as the need for the county to rethink its current grading system. Firstly, I wanted to commend the tireless efforts of teachers and staff during these unprecedented times. I can say with full sincerity that the countless hours the teachers have spent preparing and adapting to the situation have made it far easier and have not gone unnoticed by students. However, the flaws in the new system cannot be ignored. The combination of a transition to a new grading platform, as well as the full reliance on Canvas instead of Google Classroom or other platforms, have left students and staff hopelessly confused. As a student who is not only attending classes, but also working and participating in numerous extracurriculars, the uncertainty of deadlines and assigned work have been a challenge to navigate. My friends and peers have expressed similar concerns regarding the lack of clear deadlines and grading policies. Learning inequities have always existed. Distance learning simply highlights and exacerbates them. The consequences of hours of online classes, followed by additional hours of online homework, leave students physically and mentally exhausted. The effects of this exhaustion cannot be overstated. Headaches, irregular sleep schedules, and burnout are all consequences that my friends and I have noticed throughout this school year. With the advent of a new form of learning comes the necessity of a new way of grading. Continuing to work and grade students on the same scale as we would during a normal school year only harms their grades, their mental health, and their emotional stability during these trying times. Continuity of learning is important, but so is grace, empathy, and understanding. Therefore, I implore the board to th rethink the way it dictates grading policy during our time in online learning. Whether that is through a pass-fail grading system or through some other method is not for me to say, but for the good of students and staff, online learning cannot continue the way it is at present. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Kelly Speck. Hello, my name is Kelly Speck. This is my son, Bennett Speck. He is 13 years old and a student at Stephen Knowles School in Montgomery County. We um, have been at Stephen Knowles since Bennett was three in the PET program, so that would make almost 10 years, actually, in November. Bennett loves school. 
Bennett loves his teachers. Bennett loves his paraeducators. Bennett loves Mr. Jim, the swimming teacher, and all of his PTs, OTs, speech therapists, secretaries, principal, you name it. Bennett loves school. He's nonverbal. He has um, quadriplegic cerebral palsy and seizure disorder. He's fed via G-tube 100%. The nurses at Stephen Knowles are absolutely phenomenal, and he, um, any time that he enters the doors of Stephen Knowles, we know he's safe, cared for, loved, and getting a quality education. We love Stephen Knowles. We love the teachers. We are pro public school. That being said, we need a plan, Montgomery County School Board. We need a plan for when these kids are going to reenter the schools. We understand why. They have been closed so far, but what is disappointing is that there doesn't seem to be a plan with any form of metrics that we can look to, plan for, um, and just ensure that children like Bennett with IEPs and children without IEPs um, are getting what they need. So I implore you to take action. Um, parents are, have, are doing all that we can and but those of us who work, who have other children and other responsibilities, um, this cannot be indefinite. Like like it appears to be that you're allowing it to be. It seems that the teachers unions are um, steering this ship, and for many of us, we are doing our best to be patient and to trust the process. But at this point, we don't understand where you are in the planning process. We need some tangible metrics and we need to know what they will be. A virtual school is very little benefit to, benef to my son Bennett. We love the teachers. They're doing everything they can. This is not about the teachers. This is about the administration, the board, and the superintendent coming up with a plan that is fair to both teachers and students. And at this point, it feels that the students are getting the raw end of this deal. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Renee Zapatka. Hello, my name is Renee Zapatka. I have two children in the MCPS school system. Well, I should have two. I have one who's in sixth grade and a kindergartner who we have decided to pull from MCPS. Um, virtual learning for our family is just not working. We are a two household working family. Um, my son, who was in, supposed to be in kindergarten, we decided to go with a private option, um, which we thought would work best for him. And in sixth grade, virtual learning is miserable. My child has assignments in several different places where we have to sit and redo school most evenings. We also have to figure out where they're due. There's, from the last time we counted, 10 different places where my child's assignments are due. My child is not a college student. She is in sixth grade. She's jumping from fifth grade to sixth grade and expected to be a college level student with the expectations of a college level student with regards of turning in assignments. I can tell you also as someone who runs a proctoring program, these poor kids are increasingly becoming more disengaged with the learning process, especially our younger kids. Some of them are asking their teachers to please hurry up or when is this finished, as well as kids just taking breaks and walking away from the computer. And we have to um, redirect them back to the class and say, just because you're finished doesn't mean the class is finished. We also have teachers who are ending classes 20 minutes early some teachers not even showing up till 40 minutes after class has started, or they start it and ask the kids to read something so that they can accomplish something for their own children. Um, for us, I am ready to pull my sixth grader from this program because I can no longer watch teachers help and focus on their children at home and have them in and out of their classes. Um, I'm ready to go to a private entity to figure out how to get my child to learn in person. It's frustrating when I see my friends and family have their kids in different states and schools and really in the back of my mind, sitting here thinking of how I can have one of them take my child in their home so that she can have in-person learning. 
At this point, if we leave the MCPS system, we will not be coming back. You guys are not thinking of the mental health of these students. You are not thinking of the physical health that this is help causing on the students. The number of headaches, the number of tears, the number of times children are just crying because they're so frustrated with virtual learning. You don't see that, we see it. I have kids I have to consult every single day because they are beyond frustrated or stressed out. They are elementary school students, middle school students, and they are stressed out from virtual learning. There has to be a plan to get these children back into school. Whether it be hybrid or full in-school learning, there has to be a plan. We cannot continue to do full virtual learning when there are lots of districts across the United States who are going back to in-person hybrid learning successfully. I've seen it. I see kids doing sports. I see school pictures. And we are sitting here waiting to figure out when this will happen for us. There is no end in sight. And for me, if there is no end, my children will no longer be part of the MCPS program. I would rather homeschool my child, figure out how to get them out of the state or out of the district. If that's living with family, it will be living with family. If it is <clears throat> trying to figure out how to afford a private school, we will figure that out. But at this point, my one child who is not in the MCP system, MCPS system is thriving on in-person learning. He's doing a fantastic job. He's learning where I don't see that happening with virtual learning with many students. I think MCPS needs to come up with a plan. We are meeting these metrics. We are doing our job. I need MCPS, the teachers, and the Board of Education to figure out how to get these kids back in school. Next, we will hear from Elena Katzen. Hi, my name is Elena Katzen, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I am an MCPS middle schooler, and I'm talking I'm here to talk about how when a device is connected to Wi-Fi, it emits microwave radiation, which is then absorbed into our bodies. Everyone should have safe technology, but not everyone can afford this cancer prevention. Hundreds of studies show adverse health effects linked to wireless radiation, including cancer, DNA damage, and memory problems, of which I don't want anyone to suffer through. If you don't do something now, the people of my generation will suffer. So you should ask that the telecommunications companies that are currently donating MiFi's to those that don't have internet access to instead donate ethernet wires so everyone can have safe internet access. So you might have ethernet running through your walls, which you just plug into, or you might have a cable running to your home, which goes to a cable box, and then you just run a cable from there to your modem, which converts the cable into ethernet. And then the ethernet, that one wire coming from the modem, will then go into here. This is a gigabit switch, and you plug in one wire and then you can run multiple devices off of that one port. So with a cell phone or a laptop you can push on airplane mode and it'll turn off all of the routers but with a Chromebook you need to turn off each router individually. Okay so now I'm going to show you how to wire a Chromebook. So you see this little USB port you're going to plug a USB to Ethernet adapter into this port, like so, and then you'll take your Ethernet bar and you'll plug it in to your adapter, like so, and then I will show you how to turn off all the routers on your Chromebook. So you'll go to the bottom left corner where there's a little clock and then you'll go to the little gear in the top right corner that says settings. 
and you'll make sure that the slider next to Wi-Fi is off, the slider next to Bluetooth is off, then you'll scroll all the way down to where it says advanced, and then you'll make sure that the slider next to keep Wi-Fi on during sleep is off. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Katherine Katzen. My name is Katherine Katzen, and I'm an MCPS parent. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Thank you also for all you are doing to keep students and staff safe and for all you are doing to ensure that all students have computers and internet access. Many families that did not have internet access before the start of virtual learning have received my five. Other families already had internet access, many of them using Wi-Fi. It has come to my attention that the wireless microwave radio frequency radiation used in Wi-Fi and with in Wi-Fi and with MiFi is linked in published peer-reviewed studies to a multitude of health impacts, including headaches, nausea, difficulty focusing and sleeping, DNA damage, changes to reproduction, and cancer. Hundreds of scientists are calling for a reduction of wireless radiation in people rather than an increase in exposure. While this may be news to many people, it is not news to insurance companies who are not willing to take the risk of covering non-ionizing electromagnetic fields because of the well-documented adverse health effects. Other countries, including France, French Polynesia, and Cyprus, have taken steps to ban Wi-Fi in kindergarten classrooms and to restrict its use in elementary schools. Furthermore, EU Resolution 1815 recommends wired, not Wi-Fi, internet access in schools. Closer to home, the New Jersey Education Association and the Children's Environmental Health and Protection Advisory Council of the Maryland Department of the Environment have recommended turning off Wi-Fi, using wires and cable to connect to the internet, and keeping devices away from the body. When students use Chromebooks and other devices at home that are connected to the internet with MiFi or Wi-Fi, their bodies absorb wireless radiation. We now have MCPS children as young as five using Chromebooks connected via wireless for five hours a day or more. I'm thankful that I'm aware of this issue and have been able to use wired internet to reliably connect multiple computers in my home. Most people, however, do not know about the risks and are unknowingly exposing themselves and their children to adverse health effects that may take years to fully manifest. Many families couldn't afford to choose wired internet even if they knew about the risks. I'm here today to ask the Board of Education to please approach the companies that are donating MiFi to our families and ask them to instead donate safe, non-radiating wired hardware, including Ethernet wires, adapters, and modems, and service to ensure that our children are able to connect to the internet and access virtual learning without long-term harm to their health. I am also asking the board to please move forward toward wired internet when students return to the building. Thank you. And our final video testimony will come from Byron Johns and Diego Uru. Thank you very much, members of the Board of Education and Dr. Smith for allowing us to testify today. My name is Diego Uriburu. Uh, and together with Byron, we co-founded the Black and Brown Coalition. Thank you also for all of you for attending the Black and Brown Coalition's forum uh, last week, where uh, Dr. Smith and President Evans reported on uh, MCPS's progress regarding our original asks. Um, uh, MCPS rated itself, and we agree uh, uh, with a great mark in terms of uh, access uh, for black and brown students to rigorous courses and uh, there was a commitment from President Evans <coughs> to to make that practice a policy and there were very low marks regarding access uh, to effective teachers and effective leaders for black and brown students. I <coughs> am going to pass it now to Byron to talk about our new asks. Over the past seven months 
the pre-existing educational inequities have only gotten worse as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, which has ravaged the country and our community in Montgomery County. Black and brown communities have been disproportionately impacted with higher rates of illness, death, job loss, and housing insecurity. As a part of our commitment to the black and brown community, the coalition commis commissioned a study and partnered with University of Maryland School of Public Health. The study is entitled, Securing Educational Equity, Learning from the Lived Experiences of Black, Brown, and low-income children during the COVID-19 pandemic. We interviewed over 50 educators, parents, and students to gain their perspective on how the pandemic and virtual learning have impacted their communities. As a result, the coalition has developed two new asks so we can be even more responsive to the community at this time of crisis. Ask number four, all students, but particularly black, brown, and low income students whose communities have been ravaged by the COVID-19 pandemic must have access to effective accelerated learning opportunities that can reverse learning loss and redress already existing opportunity gaps. Ask number five, all students, but particularly black, brown, and low income students and their families must have regular, proactive, culturally and linguistically appropriate outreach and engagement with diverse and effective teachers and leaders in order to one, overcome environmental barriers that impede student success, and two, to elevate community voices that have previously been marginalized. As with our other asks, there are details, bullets underneath of each of these that we will provide you in writing uh, shortly after this meeting. Thank you, Byron. <clears throat> well, while the community understands that uh, COVID occurred in the middle uh, <clears throat> of, of, the, of the year uh, and that that impacted uh, MCPSs and the association's ability to move forward with asks number, <clears throat> number one and two for the coalition, it is imperative that we address them now. Uh, we, cannot, we cannot reverse learning loss and we cannot have culturally appropriate schools if we don't have effective teachers and effective leaders guiding our students. We just can't. Uh, MCPS, the associations and the Black and Brown Coalition cannot fail these children and families. That's why our communities and the Black and Brown Coalition in particular are going to be laser focused looking at the next MCPS's next hiring and assignment cycle of teachers and leaders, which we understand is on February, March, April and May. Changes must occur before them so that we seize that opportunity and we create jointly an inflection point towards equity for our children in most need. I'm talking about black and brown children. So you have been equity champions for a long time. We ask you to continue to push. We want to work with you, we'll support you. And so we count on you, MCPS, on the associations and our communities to hold you accountable uh, for doing what's right. Let's change the status quo. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that concludes public comments. Our next board meeting where we will have public comments will be on November the 10th and then public uh, pu pu the sign up will open up for public comments on November the 4th. So we really do appreciate all the students and um, community members that came to, to, to provide testimony to us. And with that, we will go to the next agenda item, item five, which is for discussion. And I will turn it over um, to Dr. Smith to introduce the topic. Thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, today, uh, as we talk about the recovery of education and the, uh, the plan to move back into uh, transition back into schools, we have a lot of information um, that we want to share today. Today's information is primarily going to focus on how our students are progressing 
uh, last year to this year and what the effects that we do know, and there are lots of things we don't know, but what the effects we do know have been on the emergency closure that the governor and the state superintendent enacted last March 12th, March 13th, uh, ironically, Friday the 13th was our last day of school in buildings last year. Then we progressed through uh, two weeks of closure and through the spring um, trying to stand up a virtual learning pro program and uh, changing it each uh, week as we went to try and meet the needs of more kids to the best we could. Um, during that time, the state test was not given. And so we don't have assessment data from, from that uh, uh, spring and for, for last year that we can look at. The Maryland State Department of Education did say, however, that uh, local school systems must administer and we wanted to and told the community and the board we were going to uh, administer diagnostics this fall and so we looked at the best way to get the most information possible and once again there are many things we don't know uh, but we did provide di diagnostic assessments in math and literacy literacy kindergarten through grade 12 this fall so we're gonna share the results of those diagnostics and the work the staff's been doing uh, to uh, interpret them, to share the information across uh, schools and classrooms, and then the work that the uh, school system will do to address those uh, gaps in learning and those disparities in learning that have been occurring for all of our students and uh, we theorize that most intensively they've been occurring for our students who are in poverty, our students who receive special education services, and our students who receive language services, and certainly areas of, of extreme concern for every child and for our most vulnerable children. Uh, in the spirit of continuous improvement, we'll also discuss changes to the elementary schedule based on feedback we've received from our staff and our families. And we said we would pay attention to their feedback as we stood this up. Uh, we'll also provide updates on athletics based on the latest guidance and announcements from the state and our most recent enrollment, engagement, attendance uh, uh, numbers and county health metrics. And this has been an area of frustration for everyone as we work through the summer, if you all remember on August 27th, literally four days before school started, the state gave us some very broad metrics. Montgomery County also has metrics and the CDC has metrics. And we've continued uh, to work with our county health uh, officers as well as our state health department and state uh, superintendent of education to do that. And in fact, the state board is looking at uh, some metrics today in their state board meeting and trying to think about how to better understand uh, how to use the metrics to make decisions. Uh, we also uh, uh, will see the data on COVID-19 cases in Montgomery County. You know, one of the problems we face and, and one of our public comments today said this, I hear it all the time, people talk about averages, an average of X, Per, uh, cases, an average of this number of cases. Well, how big is the area that you should apply an average to? Uh, that's that's an important question. And our county, for example, is 500 square miles. What's the average? And so we'll be talking about that and the effect of averages uh, as we go, as we go through today. Uh, one important uh, point I want to bring up is that when we put out our 45 day notice to return to school. That was part of our planning work. And we put that out at the end of September because that allows us to begin working on our impact bargaining with our uh, teachers association, our support professional association, our administrative association. It allows us to continue working on our plans. And we have been working on our plans so that we can move forward and look at how we can bring students back into schools uh, when it is safe. And so that 45 day notice in no way was intended to communicate that school would begin on November 9th. In fact, the board's resolution on, uh, on August 25th indicated that we would come back at the end of first marking period for a discussion. And part of that discussion is happening right now. 
And we will continue that discussion on November 6th and November 10th with some specific recommendations about how to move forward uh, in bringing students back into the physical space of schools if the metrics allow. We also have to, all of us recognize that if uh, the metrics go uh, in the negative direction to uh, the degree that, that they could, then we may and find in fact, find ourselves as a community uh, losing some of the the uh, mobility and the choices we have right now. We all know the the phases and stages of COVID-1. We've all lived through the last eight months. And so we have to pay attention to that. But on November 6th and November 10th, the staff will come back at the work session on November 6th, at the board meeting on November 10th, and talk about our reopening timeline. And so uh, that's that's what we're going to do today in this presentation. Um, Ms. Evans, do you have any uh, comments or anything that you would like to say before we move on to the presentation? Absolutely. I just really wanted to reiterate what you just stated, Dr. Smith, that the board um, was very much aware that the 45 day notice would trigger a conversation and that it was not um, the understanding that staff would come back on November the 9th. So just wanted to make certain that, um, you know, our community knows that we support our staff as well as our students, but just really wanted to make certain that we gave our staff uh, an advance notice before we um, were going to come back into the building, but just begin the um, planning so we wouldn't be caught flat footed um, once everything was um, safe and ready to return to schools. That's all I wanted to say. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Evans. Uh, and certainly I'd just like to uh, uh, finish here by saying and, and I don't say this because people need to know about my personal life, but I say it as an example of my understanding. Right now, I have six grandchildren. I have two more on the way. Two of those grandchildren are in school five days a week in Indiana. Two of them are in upstate New York, and they go to school some days, and they're on virtual other days. One of them goes to pre-K two days a week. And that's all that's possible right now instead of five days a week. And then my sixth grandchild was born with a massive uh, problem with his heart in 2018. I've talked about him a little bit before. He's two and a half years old now. We're not quite sure when he's going to be able to leave the house in the future. And in fact, I'll just be very, very transparent and clear about my current life. My wife lives in Maine most of the time, helping our daughter and son-in-law with our two and a half year old grandson because he is quarantined because of incredible health problems uh, that resulted in almost two months in Boston Children's Hospital a year ago, June, a major operation to reconstruct his heart and future operations. So um, I just say that because I want people to understand the, the vast array of circumstances that human beings have in their life right now. And what I'm experiencing is not what you're experiencing or someone else is experiencing, but we're all experiencing something. And this is very difficult and we have to figure it out together. And so I will ask Dr. McKnight now to move us into the presentation. And we have a lot of information today. And remember, we'll be back on November 6th and November 10th. We'll be watching the metrics we're going to show you closely today and be laying out what the next steps are in it's my very real hope of uh, being able to bring students back uh, into the physical space of school uh, in you know in the coming weeks and months thank you dr mcknight good afternoon board members and thank you dr smith um miss um, dr... <coughs> evans could i just um say something uh about what dr smith shared uh, about his family. I, I really appreciate your sharing that, Dr. Smith. And I do want you to know, one of the things that I really do appreciate about you is that you've been working here um, doing this job, but your love for your family and your caring for them, and you have been there yourself uh, for them uh, as well. And uh, I know you are a good man, uh, and I do appreciate very much um, men who put their family and, uh, you know, their spouse and their children and grandchildren first. So I just want to say thank you for doing that and uh, that everybody knows that you do do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dixon. Hey, thank you so much. <laughs> 
Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, for introducing the, the topic. So as Dr. Smith has shared, um, MCPS was required to administer a, an assessment to our students in the fall. And following through with that requirement, we administered the MAP assessment, which is for the uh, measures of academic progress to our students. And we administered that assessment to our students in September and early October. Today, we're going to go back and share a view of exactly how that assessment played out and sharing data from our evidence of learning um, platform showing transition grades of third, sixth, and ninth, as well as college and career readiness data for the class of 2021. This will include the specific work our central office and schools are doing to support our students and their learning and to ensure most of all that we are looking at all of our students and their needs and looking at how this all this means our mission of all means all. In addition to our student progress, we're also going to share the feedback we received regarding the elementary schedules and proposed recommendations for adjusting the schedules based on the needs of our students and families. And I just wanted to pause there uh, because I just to share appreciation for many of our staff members who emailed and reached out and gave us great suggestions and recommendations around how the schedule is going, particularly in elementary and many of our families. When we started the virtual platform process, we committed to make sure that our community had opportunities to provide feedback. And we also committed to making sure that feedback would be utilized in a way for us to come back and constantly evaluate our processes and see how they're working. So we're excited to bring that to you today as a result of our ongoing collaboration and feedback with uh, many stakeholders. We're also going to provide an update on our athletics and extracurricular programs based on the latest announcements that have come out from the state. Um, and lastly, I'll say that we're going to provide the latest health metrics as we have continue to do and will further do um, to make sure that we are having discussions around what does it look like for us to define a safe environment for returning our students? In addition to that, we're also gonna share enrollment updates, engagement and attendance numbers. Before I turn this over, I also want to uh, highlight a, a brief update on professional development. On October 6th, the board approved uh, November 4th as being a professional development day for our staff. And based on the feedback that was provided and, and in collaboration with many others, we wanted to make sure this was planning time, this day was dedicated to planning time that is needed for our staff while they are implementing all of the needs in a virtual environment. That's very important. We hear from our staff and, and from our families on a regular basis about all the things that our teachers are doing from a creative perspective and different tools that they're trying to, uh, to make sure that we're engaging our students and most of all that they're learning. And I've had an opportunity to visit a number of our classrooms here over the past few weeks and I've actually seen firsthand many of our teachers being very creative in implementing spaces for our students to engage and learn. And I just wanna share a, a really deep appreciation for that. So with that said, as we think about the November 4th professional day that is coming up, we want this to be a professional development provided for a, a critical component of efforts to provide all MCPS students with high quality instruction through the virtual environment through supporting our staff. So this day has been designed to be unstructured and self-driven by the staff to meet the specific goals of each staff member, which is critically important when we think about professional development, because while the system does design professional development to support our staff, it's also important that there's investment in everyone's personal journey around the professional development that they need. And so I'm looking forward to our staff being able to engage in the professional learning that's driven by them as professionals on the November 4th day. Of course, on this day, food service will continue to be provided for our students. Um, and there's also going to be a message shared with our staff throughout the system later today that includes a link to the professional development opportunities that are available to our staff. So on that note, as I acknowledge, uh, you know, some of the work that our staff have done in the buildings, we're going to see a brief video on instructional leadership. Um, right now. And after that, we will then be joined by Dr. Keisha Addison to share an update on our student progress data. Thank you. The principal in Montgomery County Public Schools is large and encompasses. Depending on the day, I'm here, I'm there. Outside at recess. I have 
standing meetings or check-ins with different people. Supporting paras. With my security team leader. Visiting classrooms. With my business administrator. Uh, making sure we have building service staff. All of that is happening every day. The most significant role and the primary responsibility of the principal and the many leaders at each school is instruction. This work is a primary focus so that students can reach their academic potential. So you, you have to have a good team around you. You have to have strong assistant principals who help with the instructional leadership piece. You have to have a strong staff development teacher. And really my role here at Burnt Mills um, from the day I started is to grow and develop teacher leaders so that they in turn can go into the classroom and provide um, intentional and explicit instruction that's going to move our students. Some students might be ready to move to the pictorial level, yeah. whereas others are still in the concrete. Right. And we also need to recognize that you know we have students who are... I operationalize instructional goals uh, throughout my building in many ways, and I like to look at them as um, leadership best practices. Um, I have a staff development teacher who um, is a master scheduler. I have a reading specialist who is very hands-on. Um, I have team leaders who I rely on every day to share my vision and my message. Um, it's very clear that they are focused in the work that they do and they're very serious about making sure students have what they need at every level. We have to hold one another accountable um, as teachers for the students that we serve, all of the students. So we have a culture here at Burnt Mills where if we hear something that it, we want to challenge, we feel comfortable to challenge another teacher. The work we do here lays the foundation for students to have opportunities later on in life. There was an effective use of space in an observed art classroom. It's important to provide the structure, provide teachers and teacher leaders in the building with very clear direction as to what the plan is and, and why, why we are doing it, to communicate, communicate, communicate. When great teaching is happening, then great learning is happening, great feelings are happening. It's just really important for the principal to prioritize that part of a teacher's profession. Very often the principal is, is the model, is the source of, of the movement, the progress. We're on the work. We're on the work of moving our data, making changes in what's happening at Rockville High School through our instructional practices. I'm passionate about being the principal here at Burnt Mills and I think it shows um, every day in my walk and in my talk and if nothing else I lead by example. It's a difficult job, it's not easy, uh, but it, it's, it's so rewarding uh, on so many levels. Thank you so much. And again, we appreciate our leaders for all of their support in building instructional model support for, for our teachers in their buildings. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Addison. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Slides, please. Thank you. And so one of the things, um, first I want to say good afternoon. One of the things you heard from both Dr. Smith and Dr. McKnight is that we use the measures of academic progress assessment or the MAP assessment as a measure to di for a diagnostic for this fall performance of students. And prior to sharing the performance of the data of students, I wanted to acknowledge some of the challenges with the fall administration of the MAP assessment. The first thing is that given we are in this virtual environment, we needed to administer the assessment virtually. And that is something that was new to both students um, and staff. And so we recognize that this may have presented some challenges um, for individuals. Additionally, the NWEA association or organization had some technical challenges um, that impacted all of its partners, not just us. And so this led to intermittent disruptions of the assessments when students were taking the assessments, which could have turned some folks off. <clears throat> Another acknowledgement we want to make is the reports of parents and or sibling assistance for some students when taking the assessment. 
even NWEA acknowledged when they looked at patterns of performance, there was a marketed increase um, in performance of students, particularly those in primary grades, which might have indicated that this was due to such support. In addition to this, we received opt-out requests from parents or guardians, unlike in the past. And then finally, the time to take the assessment was longer for some students in the past. Again, this could have been due to the nature of virtual setting or some technical challenges. And so before transitioning to the next slide, I do wanna um, acclimate you to what you will see with regards to performance of students on the MAP assessment. Data will pre be presented for the transition grades as Dr. McKnight indicated, which is connected to our evidence of learning reporting. That is, you will see um, performance of students in grades six, three, six, and nine. And for each grade level, you will see three data visuals, one for all students, one for students in focus groups, and one for students receiving services. Next slide, please. And so we will begin with um, performance of grade three students on MAP Mathematics or MAP M and MAP Reading or MAP R. Next slide, please. What you see here is a trend of the performance of grade three students on the fall administration of MAP. This view can help you understand the impact of COVID on the performance of grade three students. In fall of 2018, 59.1% of grade three students met the 50th national percentile. In fall of 2019, we see that that percent of grade students meeting was 61%. But this fall, we see that the percent of grade three students meeting the 50th percentile was 55%. And what we know for our current grade three students is that their interruption to traditional in-person instruction began in March due to COVID. Next slide, please. In examining differences by the focus groups for the three years, notice there is a decrease for all groups. COVID has impacted all student groups, not just those who are Black or African American or Hispanic, or even those who are impacted by poverty. Differences between groups and the percent of students at or above the 50th national percentile occurred across all years. Next slide, please. Here you see the percent of our students receiving services who met the 50th percentile, again, for three different fall administrations of the MAP-M. One thing you will notice on this slide is the increase for students receiving special education services. You will hear more about the work with these students later in the presentation. Next slide, please. Now, transitioning to MAP reading or MAP-R, again, looking at um, three years of data, we see a slight decrease in the percent of grade three students meeting the 50th national percentile this fall. Next slide, please. Here we have the performance of the focus groups for MAP R grade three. Unlike the pattern that was observed for MAP M, there are slight increases in the percent of students in fall 2020 meeting the 50th percentile for almost all groups. Hispanic Latino students receiving free and reduced price meal system services or farms had a slight decrease this fall in the percent meeting the 50th percentile. Next slide. And for students receiving services, that is farms, special ed, and those identified as limited English proficiency, again, we see an increase in the percent of students receiving special education services who met the 50th percentile. Next slide. Now I will share an examination of current grade three students on reading on grade level. This lens is in response to the board regulation put forth by Ms. Dixon. To provide some information before we move into this data, it uses MAP Reading Fluency, which is a universal screener and progress monitoring assessment of early reading. And it measures oral reading fluency, decoding accuracy, and literal comprehension. Next slide, please. On this slide is the grade two performance of MAP reading fluency for our current grade three students. And so 67.9% of students in the winter who are now our third graders were meeting the grade two expectation as measured by MAP reading fluency. Next slide. When we look at this by the focus groups, again, the focus is their grade two performance. 
you see that there are differences in the percent of students who are meeting the grade level expectation. Next slide, please. And here is the services view of those students in terms of meeting the grade two expectation. Next slide. On this slide, the view shifts. So I wanna point this out for you. We are now looking at the 67.9% of students who left grade two meeting the expectation in winter and looking at whether they are meeting the 50th percentile now as measured by the fall administration in their third grade year. And so what you see here is there is a slight decrease in the percent of the current grade three students who are meeting the second grade expectation now in the fall. Next slide, please. And as we look at the performance by focus groups, we see decreases from grade two performance to grade three. All groups had decreases with the largest decrease observed for Hispanic Latino students receiving farms. Next slide, please. And now looking at services, a similar decrease was observed across all groups. Next slide, please. Now we'll transition to the performance of grade six students. Again, you will see data for mathematics first, followed by reading. Next slide, please. For mathematics, we notice a slight decrease in the percent of grade six students who took the MAP assessment this past fall, meeting the 50th percentile compared to prior years. Next slide. And looking at the performance for students in the focus groups, a similar pattern that we saw for grade three is also seen here. Decreases in the fall performance for this for 2020 for almost all groups. There was about a three percentage point increase for grade six black or African-American students receiving farms this fall compared to last fall. Next slide, please. And for services, we see slight decreases for students receiving farms and those receiving special education services. A slight increase was observed for students identified as limited English proficient. Later in the pr presentation, you will hear about what we are doing for students in the ESOL program to address achievement. Next slide, please. Now to look at reading performance. Again, a similar pattern of a slight decrease in the percent of all students meeting the 50th percentile compared to two years prior. Next slide, please. And examining the performance for the focus groups, there is a difference here for fall 2020 and that slight increases in the percent of students meeting the 50th percentile is observed for non-farms, Hispanic, Latino students and black or African-American students receiving farms. I do wanna point out that the non-farms black or African-American student percent meeting the 50th percentile remained steady um, across the three years. Next slide, please. For grade six students receiving services, slight increases were observed for this fall for students receiving special education and those identified as limited English proficient. And now I will transition to Dr. Brenda Lewis, who will provide an overview of what we are doing to meet our students' academic needs at the elementary and middle school levels. Thank you, Dr. Edison. Good afternoon, everyone. Next slide, please. What are we doing to address uh, our student achievement at the elementary and middle school levels? I will talk from the curriculum lens, and you will hear later in the presentation from principals who are talking from the school level lens. The first piece that we wanted to share about this evening was our professional development. We have very robust professional development that is both from a vendor standpoint, as well as designed and implemented within our curriculum teams. And our vendor and our MCPS generated professional development focuses on all of the different components of what the instruction should look like within the curriculum. We also work on how do we adjust the curriculum and modify it to meet the needs of all of our students. I wanted to share with you an example of a professional learning opportunity that was provided to our math leaders. 
our math team presented during a professional learning opportunity, a modeling of a grade level team examining student data from one of our assessments. The purpose of the data analysis was be able to be able to inform grading. This resulted in a member of the elementary math team being then invited after providing this training to our math leaders to a school site where that math team member met with a group of teachers to take that learning and to bring that at a deeper level so that our school was then able to learn from our math team for what was very relevant to their practices within their school. We also provide professional development to our teachers, staff, and our leaders within the areas of English language development, as well as meeting the needs of our students who receive special education supports. Another way that we support is to provide guidance on implementation of the curriculum, particularly with a lens on virtual learning. And that occurs during our principal office hours that we have on a weekly basis. This also includes very particular guidance around small group instruction and various components of the lesson, as well as what does that independent learning time look like and comprise of. Our supervisors and specialists also virtually visit schools and classrooms to provide modeling, coaching, feedback, and also to see great practices that we can replicate across other sites. Today, I was literally in a meeting and I heard one of our supervisors say, we are actually benefiting in the virtual environment from being able to visit many more schools because we don't have travel time. I can hang up from one Zoom and jump into another Zoom with another school. We have also been partnering with School Support and Improvement who have provided professional learning to our sites on utilizing MAP data. And we're currently designing professional development for our sites to build upon that training and to take our MAP data to a deeper level of studying at the content standard level, as well as the strand level and what we will do about that to make informed decisions. We have been fortunate to offer supplemental programming for before and after school for our students to receive additional supports within reading and math as part of our CARES funding. And this enrichment provides targeted instruction for students that benefit from additional support in addition to their school day. Now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Mrs. Hazel, our Associate Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. Thank you. If you can go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk about how we are addressing the needs of our ESOL students. As you saw from the presentation from Dr. Addison, uh, our ESOL students did experience learning loss during the spring and summer months. And our goal for all of our ESOL students is to build proficiency with their academic language so that they can access the grade level content. Our classroom and our course content teachers spent the summer and now into the fall training together with our new curriculum consultants to deliver the curriculum and include an English language development strategies within their instruction. This fall, we're being very intentional about ensuring that our students are receiving instruction in reading, writing, speaking, and listening the four areas that all of our, our ESOL students need um, to become more proficient with their English. And we are including those four areas into our virtual lessons. We're also providing ESOL leaders and teachers with weekly and or monthly support and giving them a platform to discuss their best practice, practices in the classroom. ESOL and content teachers have increased their co-planning and co-teaching opportunities in the virtual environment as well. We've also purchased additional academic interventions for schools in both mathematics and literacy for students to engage in during the school day. And we have been training our teachers and paraeducators with the use of those interventions. We've also used our CARES funding to support our students with before after school programming and providing them interventions that are specific to ESOL students. And finally, at the high school level, we've purchased online grade level novels 
and we are monitoring the progress of our ESOL students who are engaging in grade level instruction through ELD uh, classes and also our English courses. So at this time, I'm gonna hand it over to Mr. Kevin Lowndes who will talk about special education. Thank you very much, Ms. Hazel. Uh, so this afternoon, we're talking about special education and what we're doing to help our students uh, perform at a high level in reading and math and all our struggling learners. So the special education is working very closely with the curriculum department to make sure that we're providing support and intervention to our schools for our students that struggle with reading and math. And we're making sure that they all understand how to look at the multiple data points to identify the areas that students are struggling in to identify the proper interventions that students need in order to uh, improve in those areas that they're struggling in. You know, a couple of years ago, we stopped training just special education teachers in the interventions and started training general education teachers, paraeducation teachers, and special education teachers in the in interventions with an understanding that all three of those teachers, in, in, including the paraeducators, uh, work with our students throughout the day and work to help them achieve at a high level within reading and math. For example, with Orton Gillingham and Really Great Reading, two interventions that work on phonemic awareness and decoding, we have trained 519 general education teachers in Orton Gillingham and 420 general education teachers in Really Great Reading, 444 special education teachers in Orton Gillingham and 500 special education teachers in Really Great Reading, and 68 paraeducators in Orton Gillingham and 190 paraeducators in Really Great Reading. This su helps support our struggling. Uh, students with phonemic awareness and decoding throughout the, the day, no matter whether they're in the general education classroom or they're working specifically with a special education teacher or paraeducator. The other thing is that we're doing is we're working with the curriculum office and we're providing an extra day of training when we train within the new curriculums for reading and math so that our special education teachers have an opportunity to identify strategies to make that new curriculum more accessible for our students receiving uh, special education services. We are, uh, uh, we also receive some CARES tutoring money to provide uh, tutoring after school uh, for our students that are struggling. And we continue to provide academic and behavior uh, consults uh, to families that are uh, struggling in the distance learning format. And so we will continue to work on uh, providing supports to our students, our schools, and uh, with our curriculum office to make sure that all struggling students have an opportunity to learn. At this time, I, it's my honor to introduce Dr. Stacy Ashton, principal of Burt Mills Elementary School, to explain what she's doing at her school. Good afternoon. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you for this opportunity. So this afternoon, I'm going to talk about grade three readiness and a few things that we do at Burt Mills to support student growth in grades K through two. We know at the elementary level that without a strong foundation in reading, students are left behind at the beginning of their education. And students who are not reading on grade level by the end of the third grade typically struggle in every class from year to year. We also know that students will not be able to process increasingly challenging texts with fluency and understanding in the upper grades if they do not have a solid grasp on the early reading behaviors. Serving as a universal screener in grades K and 1, MAP-RF is an assessment that we use to identify students in the primary grades who are at risk for reading. Using the MAP-R, our teachers evaluate early reading behaviors in the areas of phonological awareness, phonics and word study, listening comprehension, and vocabulary. After careful evaluation, my teachers develop student profiles and plan small group lessons to meet the, the needs of their students. We also know that MAPRF data is used as a screener to identify students who may need an intervention. And at Burnt Mills, we have 
several intervention plans, but I'm going to talk specifically about one. Looking at the data, teachers can quickly access, I'm sorry, can quickly assess students who have met, exceeded, or approaching the MAPR expectation. This we know is useful information for day-to-day -day instruction, as well as developing intervention groups for students who need a little more or for students who are not learning enough. Our goal is to make sure students in the primary grades, K through two, meet the evidence of learning external measure. Last year, we implemented Orthan Gillingham, or as we call it, OG, which is a phonics phonological program that uses the multisensory strategies to teach the connection between sounds and letters. Like MAPRF, this intervention approach is focused upon the learning needs of each individual student at Burnt Mills and is designed to help our struggling readers. Our intervention program at Burnt Mills typically lasts about 10 weeks. The group size is between four to six students and the sessions are daily lasting 30 minutes. Student progress is monitored and learning is evaluated by a built-in assessment. I am proud to say that we have six teachers trained to teach OG at Burnt Mills. And currently we have 15 first graders and 18 second graders receiving OG intervention during the school day. This year, well actually last week, we implemented an after school program through the CARES Act. This program allowed us to provide extended learning opportunities to students who are reading below grade level. Our program specifically operates four days a week from 345 to 445. And as I mentioned, we just started the program last week, but right now we have six first graders and five second graders participating in the program. And we just opened the program up to our third, fourth and fifth graders and I was able to hire additional teachers to serve as facilitators or instructors for those students. So I'm really excited about that. Lastly, I would just like to end by saying everything that I just talked about is needed and is done at Burnt Mills to support student growth. But we can't lose sight of the fact that good first instruction is a critical learning pathway to making sure students are learning and learning enough. At Burnt Mills, we believe in good first instruction. When you walk into a K through two classroom, you will see sight word work, anchor charts, teachers modeling with multiple anchor texts, interactive writing, a phonics instructional program that's aligned with OG, flexible grouping, technology in action, and so much more. In addition to good first instruction, my teachers are actively engaged in co-teaching, weekly collaborative planning, and professional growth and development. I'm happy to say that our hard work is paying off. I would like to highlight our first graders. This year's MAP RF data showed that 70% of my first graders met or exceeded the phonological awareness benchmark, and 84% of my first graders met or exceeded the phonics word study benchmark. Way to go first grade. Now I will turn it over to my colleague, Principal Jordan B to speak about her use of data to inform student progress at Sligo Creek Middle School. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity to just share a little bit about how we use our map data. I am so grateful to um, have MAP as a diagnostic as one of the tools that help us to identify where our kids are right now, um, how they have trended and will trend in the past and in the future, um, and how we can help them to grow to realize their fullest potential. So at Sligo, we really talk about using our MAP data to focus on the now and the next. So thinking in the current, what can we do right now for our students? And one of the things that we use most often is the MAP Quadrant Growth Reports. Um, these reports help us as a team to analyze what our students' current growth is versus what the assessment says should be the expected growth. So it's a really easy way for us to see 
um, which students are meeting um, current growth expectations and not just benchmark growth from where they are as individuals. Um, in reviewing this growth, we're able to see um, if we already have interventions that are already in place. So looking at what we've outlined uh, when students registered for classes in January, is it appropriate? Um, is there more that needs to be done? And, and more specifically, are there students that we have missed or students who did not require intervention that now do? Those are things that we can address right now. Those are course changes that we can make in the moment. So what do we have going on for students and um, depending on how they've met their growth? We've also had the opportunity to utilize some of our CARES Act tutoring funds in order to select additional interventions for students where a course change might not be appropriate or um, even beneficial for the student in their schedule. So based on that, we've been able to offer after school options to support student growth. At Sligo Middle School, we've seen that our math data shows a greater loss for learning than our reading data, much like much of what Dr. Addison showed you earlier. And so that really has some long-term implications for us as well. So focusing on the next. In secondary schools, we start planning our master schedule in November when we start aligning what courses we will offer. These might include intervention courses mentioned um, such as Read 180, System 44, uh, uh, algebra support or IM support. In order to better predict what we will need, this data has been great in letting us know just how many more seats we're gonna have to offer, how we're going to have to expand. So our map data has been really critical in our master schedule planning. Um, and as students register for classes coming up in just January, um, this will help us plan for the next. Um, one of the things that I've been grateful for with the MAP data is being able to talk to parents as individuals. Uh, one of my favorite things to do as principal is sitting down with parents and talking about a student's profile and what we can do specifically to address what each child will need. And so I just want to say, as I close out with my time, that just really getting an opportunity to look at those quadrant reports and being able to plan for the, this moment and also the next moment has been very important. And I would encourage any secondary school that is planning for that master schedule, which is a key part of how we service students, um, that this must be a part of it. And now I'd like to turn it back over to Dr. Addison, who will share about high school progress. Thank you very much. And so now I will share with you data on the performance of grade nine students on the MAP assessment. This view for the grade level is different due to the transition to high school. And so data will show the performance of fall 2019 of grade eight students and fall 2020 for grade nine students. And one reason for this is that we historically have not administered MAP at the ninth grade level. Um, and so the trend data is not available. However, the most recent experience for MAP for our current ninth graders was their eighth grade winter administration. And so we can now look at the performance of these students and um, next slide, please. Sorry. And so as the, you see on this slide, we see that in the fall of 2019, 63.4% of grade eight students met the 50th percentile. And now when we look at grade nine students this fall, we see a decrease in that 46.3% of our current grade nine students met the 50th percentile. Next slide, please. Again, looking at the view for the focus groups, we see the same pattern that was observed not only for grades three and six, but also in the previous slide that decreases are observed for all students across all focus groups. Next slide, please. And a similar pattern is observed for um, math mathematics for students who received services, particularly um, for students receiving farms where we see the large decreases as well as those who are identified as limited English proficient. Next slide, please. Shifting to map R, we see the same decrease in looking at the percent of grade eight students who met the 50th percentile in the fall of 2019 
versus our grade nine students meeting the 50th percentile this fall. Next slide, looking at the focus groups, we see similar decreases, the same pattern that we've seen for mathematics is also observed for reading. Next slide. And again, similar decreases for students receiving services. And now we'll transition to Mr. Scott Murphy, who is going to share about the performance related to Maryland College and career readiness. Good afternoon, board members. I'm gonna share the annual Maryland College and Career Readiness status for the students in the class of 2021 and compare those current seniors to the class of 2020 last year. <clears throat> Across the top are the various measures that are used to indicate whether a student is college and career ready or CCR and the percent of students that have met in each option. These include results on AP, IB exams, the SAT or ACT, and other measures used for CCR. On the far right is the combined total status for the class of 21 and the class of 2020 next to it for comparison. This slide represents mathematics. As you can see on the right, current seniors in all of our student focus groups, beginning with non-farms, Black or African-American students, have a higher rate of meeting CCR math standards in the class of 2020. Also, our service groups, Farm, Special Education, and ESOL also have higher rates of meeting CCR benchmarks in math this year. The next slide is a similar view for literacy. Making sure that's up. Uh, compared to the class of 2020, again, our current seniors and all of the student focus groups have a higher rate of meeting CCR benchmarks in literacy. Also, the service groups uh, have also have higher rates of CCR and literacy, as you can see going down the right when compared to the class of 2020. Next slide, please. Throughout the pandemic, we have sustained efforts to ensure that students have access to these various CCR measures and have opportunities that are focused on college and career readiness. This includes over 39,000 AP exams that were taken in May 2020 in the virtual at-home format offered by the College Board. Also increased enrollment in AP courses this year and recent efforts to ensure access to the SAT this fall. In September and October recently, over 2,700 MCPS students took the SAT in MCPS test centers and we have additional administrations planned in November and also December. Also enrollment in dual credit courses at Montgomery College and in our career programs is also increasing this year. Another important priority is ensuring that students remain on track for graduation and have opportunities to earn or recover credits they need. This includes over 3,700 students who earned high school credit and virtual summer school this past summer, continued expansion of online courses that students are taking now, and ongoing work that we're still doing to resolve incompletes from last year. For our seniors, our graduation validation teams and all MCPS high schools are monitoring seniors student by student to make sure they have the required credits they need, and if not, mobilize with the central office to provide support and intervention to make sure they graduate on time. And given the additional map data that schools now have, high schools are using the data to program for interventions that you heard about earlier and CARES Act supports, um, as well as being able to monitor progress in new ways and, and support teachers and teams in planning for instruction. And that includes teachers in all content areas. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ms. Billy Jean Benson, principal at Rockville High School to share a bit more about what this looks like at Rockville High School. Good evening, thank you, Scott. Um, monitoring students at Rockville High School begins in the summer when students are entering ninth grade. Uh, that has not changed in our virtual environment. Um, our team of counselors, assistant principals, all of our resource teachers, our ESOL, uh, ESOL resource teacher, and our registrar along um, with individual teachers are part of the team that begins that monitoring process over the summer in collaboration with the uh, teachers and counselors at our feeder middle school. We have weekly meetings between our assistant principals and our team of counselors, the pairs of counselors and administrators. We uh, meet weekly to discuss 
students to look at credits, to look at courses, to follow the students through grades 9, 10, 11, and 12. There are bi-monthly meetings with the full counseling team and the administrators and, and additional uh, resource teachers at different points uh, each during different times of the year. And at the semester, we do a full on track review for graduation for all of our students and make adjustments, uh, incorporate credit recovery, uh, online pathways when appropriate, uh, credit checks for all of our students. And that happens throughout all of the grades. Our counselors uh, don't support students by grade level, they support them by alphabet. So that allows each of our counselors to be closely aligned with a group of students for four years, but also a variety of students. And they are on top of the requirements at all grade le levels and not just at one particular grade level. That particular that works for us at Rockville. Um, as Scott mentioned, we are now including our map data, our recent map data after testing all of our students. We've hired a lead teacher and three teachers to uh, start our CARES program after school just after the first of next month. So we are very involved in that. And then for our seniors, our monitoring includes, as mentioned, the credit validation program. This is something that uh, a program of database that was added to our supports and monitoring system a year ago. We are continuing to use it as are all high schools. And it has made a very big difference uh, for Rockville in terms of not only having school supports in one large database, uh, tracking college and career readiness, tracking uh, students' credit and credit recovery and courses that they have taken, but also helps us um, with central office supports throughout the course of the year uh, and has really helped us to be able to monitor students right up to the day of graduation to ensure that all students uh, as much as possible are eligible and able to graduate on, on time using that original year of graduation model, as well as keeping students on track for graduation in each year, leaving ninth grade, leaving 10th grade, leaving 11th grade. One of the, some of the established processes and procedures and priorities that are very much a part of Rockville High School are the, uh, the articulation with our feeder pattern, uh, as well as articulation from 9th to 10th to 11th and 12th grade, and our master schedule. Uh, we have a master schedule team. We have an assistant principal who has led the master schedule process along with our resource counselor, and that also includes uh, members of our special education team, our ESOL team, ESOL and special education uh, resource teacher, as well well as our IB and AP coordinators who throughout the course of the master schedule process are part of the collaboration of making sure that we are focused on access for all the placement of courses, the offerings of courses, and making sure that we are looking at students and making sure that students are involved in advanced coursework and that advanced coursework is the expectation for all students at Rockville High School. It may not happen in the same year, but the the uh, expectation is certainly that everyone has access to advanced coursework, particularly AP and or IB uh, throughout their time that they are at Rockville High School. We also are very much focused on uh, offering and providing the options of dual enrollment through our CCIC, our College and Career Coordinator, and our DEPA through the Counseling Department. We offer a full IB program, a full AP program, and also the IBCP program, which allows for that career pathway option for many of our students uh, throughout uh, uh, our school. Uh, we are also focused on SAT school day, making sure that we are providing that opportunity for as many of our schools as possible, I'm sorry, many of our students as possible to be college and career ready by their end of their time at Rockville. And, and through this, and some of these have been mentioned already, but I just want to speak specifically about Rockville High School and the interventions and supports that we've been uh, focused on. Our project graduation supports have, a, uh, load, have offered us the opportunity to provide AP and IB summer programs, AP and IP, IB programs uh, after school and before school support programs during the school year, credit recovery programs, the access to keeping our media center open after school every day of the week, restorative justice practices, and programs and sponsorships for a variety of our students. We've also uh, accessed summer school programs, particularly this past summer through the Summer School 2020 through the CARES Act funding, through our TAWS, uh, the TAWS Access Program, and also online pathways, all of which have supported Rockville students in making sure that they were eligible and able to graduate as close to their year of graduation as possible. And we're very proud of our success, particularly this past year. And with that, 
We will now take some questions from the Board of Education regarding what has been shared. Great, thank you so much for that presentation. We'll start off with Mr. Asante. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for the presentation. I think it is kind of disappointing to see the uh, downward trend with some of these scores, but I think that was to be expected with um, everything going on. Uh, the thing that stood out for me the most was, I think it was with the um, grade six map R data, is I did see um, there was an upward trend for some of the different focus groups in terms of their scores. And I was wondering if we knew why that was, and because I think it um, could help us um, moving forward as we move out of um, virtual learning to figure out you know, what during virtual learning allowed those scores to increase. Thank you. I didn't know. Okay. Mr. Sante, thank you. I was going to uh, direct that question to Dr. Wilson. Um, I know that's been a discussion they've been having internally about the follow-up next step, so I'll let her address that. Sure. Um, certainly, we uh, noticed the uptick, and in particular, if you looked at the special education uh, in terms of the um, service groups, on several of the slide views, you notice that there was an increase in performance. And I think even for the sixth grade, what we're seeing there is the impact of interventions that were put into place for students early on in um, as they were in elementary school. Um, I think that uh, is you know, a one-to-one -one or a cause-effect relationship is sometimes very difficult to narrow down, but I do think we're much more intentional in our um, blocks in particular for reading in terms of providing interventions all the way up through um, elementary school. Thank you. Okay, so I'm asking board members to ask one question. I'll circle back around to you. And with that, I will go next to Ms. Silvestre. Yeah, my question is about the high school uh, data. It's the... Um, I think where we're seeing the greatest decreases, 20 plus percentage points. And I wanted to get your take on what happened there. I know that we don't give the map or have not given the map in ninth grade. So maybe it's, that's always been a drop that we hadn't caught before, but just wanted to get your take on why such drastic decreases, 20 plus percentage points across the board uh, from the eighth to ninth grade um, data. Certainly that, uh, that particular drop is very concerning. Um, and what I believe the methodology was, and I'm going to raise this and look for Dr. Addison to correct me, but we discussed a lot about how to approach that analysis because we didn't, um, as, as Keisha pointed out, um, or Dr. Addison pointed out, we, we haven't historically given the MAP assessment. Um, and I, I believe that that data actually looked at the eighth grade um, that did perform at the 50th percentile. And then we looked at those same students. We didn't look at the entire ninth grade. I believe that that was the methodology, Dr. Addison. Uh, no, not for that one. That was um, the grade two to three. The okay. for the eighth to ninth grade was more of a cohort view so of the eighth graders who took it last year and now looking at the ninth graders but that is definitely something that we will look into going forward in terms of of those who met we didn't do that same lens of those who met in eighth grade who is continuing to meet in a ninth grade it may show a different pattern and to um also add on miss silvestri one of the things that you mentioned um because we haven't historically administered map in the ninth grade. I think that is something that we can continue to monitor going forward um, around how does that performance and that transition from eighth to ninth look. We typically use different measures in our evidence of learning framework around that. So it's not necessarily that always that single measure for map that we use. Yes. And, and so just to pick up on the question, um, you know, map gives us a standards based analysis um, that we can compare to when those same students took the assessment in eighth grade. Um, and also, you know, the ninth grade students are somewhat the most familiar, have the, the immediate recollection of taking the MAP assessment. 
So we will be behind that data, examining that those standards, and we will be working with uh, our no our instructional department will be working with developing um, professional development for our ninth grade uh, teachers on specifically what that data tells us because they aren't accustomed to using that map information. Uh, but it is does provide us a wealth of information in terms of how we need to approach uh, teaching and learning to make sure that the gaps that we've identified um, are, are mitigated, restored, and that students can continue their learning. So I, I would ask that we go ahead and do that analysis of the students who took it in the eighth grade and then took it again in the ninth grade. So we see student to student, actual students over those two administrations and get a sense of what, that will give us a much clearer sense of what loss they might have experienced uh, from last winter to this fall. And uh, then we can send that to the board members and we can repost it here with this meeting so it'll be available to everyone. But uh, that, you know, we look at things a lot of different ways, but I think that analysis yes. will be very helpful because it will either confirm what we see mm -hmm. in this presentation today or it will tell us uh, a different story. It may not be a better story, but it may tell us a different story. It'll also be very helpful to uh, uh, Principal Benson and other high school principals to see exactly what the students sitting in front of them happened to them over those two years. Yes, Dr. Smith, and, and as you point out, like Keisha and I have a, a number of conversations about how to approach the data. And uh, this is definitely a starting point for us. We will look at this many different ways uh, to inform the work. And uh, you know, this information also is in our data, our data management system that will afford school-based teams that additional analysis that they need by those standards. So that information is available to the schools. So we will uh, do that analysis and bring that back. Thank you. We'll go to Ms. Dixon. Thank you, Shepherd. Uh you're catching me off guard. I'm trying to figure out how you're going around and doing this and calling on us. But uh, I do want to uh, just um, thank uh, everyone uh, for the presentation. Uh, Dr. Addison um, uh, for the data and um, our principals, uh, Stacy Ashton, um, uh, Shana Geran, Gerandby. Okay. And Billie Jean Benson. Um, I have to tell you, I love to hear uh, from the principals at the board table. And uh, I'm going to uh, focus on, uh, well, one thing that I have picked up from this is that uh, we obviously need to get kids back into school as soon as we can. Um, you know, I think uh, that's uh, pretty clear and, you know, how we do that. Um, uh, is work obviously for Dr. Smith and his staff uh, to do. Uh, but I do wanna just um, uh, single out uh, uh, Dr. Ashton because the things that you shared uh, were just music uh, to my ears. And the whole piece with the third graders being able to read on or above grade level, I think is the key to our achievement opportunity gap. And if we can get all of them uh, reading above or on or above grade level, I think we this we can say that we have, you know, narrowed this gap. Everything else that comes after uh, is uh, just mana from heaven as far as I'm concerned. But that being able to read is uh, a real uh, human right. Um, so uh, I would like to be able to get this all printed out, uh, the data, so I can really kind of marinate in it. Uh, so I don't have any specific questions, but just to thank you all for, um, you know, the work that you're doing on this. And, um, and of course, uh, the principals, you know, you have my great admiration and uh, respect for uh, what you do. And it's just great to hear from you at the board table. I really appreciate that. So thank you very much. 
Thank you. So now we will hear from Dr. Daka. Hey, uh, we, I really do want to thank all of you, just as Ms. Dixon did, um, <clears throat> Dr. Ashton and Ms. Jaranby and uh, Ms. Benson. Uh, there were so many things that came through here, and I have not digested this as well as I would like. So I'm going to have to keep looking at it. But I'm going to go back to slide 26. What are we going to do about it? Approach to addressing stu student achievement, ESOL. And so many of the things in there look like they would be good things to do with all students. Is there anything preventing us from doing that? And I guess that's gonna be my only question. I got another one too, but okay. I, tell me about that later. I, I just wanted to ask a question. And, uh, and what Dr. Ashton was doing with all of her students, that included the whole school population Speakers of English as well as speakers of other languages. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. But thank you again for the presentation, and I will look into it a little bit more. Okay. I'll go to Mrs. Um, Smondrowski now. Thank you. Um, and so I will associate myself with my colleagues and thanking everybody for um, the work that they're doing and trying to make this virtual learning experience um, the best that it can be. Um, but I do want to associate myself with the comments of Ms. Dixon in that, you know, um, while I um, appreciate the work that we're doing in the, along these lines, um, I'm still very concerned about the decreases that we've seen, particularly in the eighth grade um, and for the high school students. Um, you know, I think this is kind of further evidence that we really need to get at least small groups back into uh, our in-person learning as soon as possible. You know, before the end of January, um, I, uh, I'm concerned about some of the accuracy of this data only because, um, you know, I talk to a lot of students and I hear a lot of stories of, um, I guess you'll just, we'll just bluntly call it cheating. Um, so, you know, working together, working collaboratively. Um, so I'm just curious how we are making sure that this is as accurate as it can be. And um, I'm interested in um, seeing, you know, what the real effects are, because I suspect that the learning loss is even greater than, um, than what we're seeing here, potentially. Thank you, Ms. Mondrowski, for that question. Um, one of the limitations we listed and the staff listed early on in this presentation was exactly that. Um, with us providing our students an assessment in the virtual environment, um, there are control factors that we can normally have in place within the classroom in-person setting that just uh, are not the same as we're doing assessments virtually. So that's why we listed that as one of our initial limitations uh, because of that. Um, we're also in discussions about how do we reconcile much of this data because like you said, given those limitations, we're going to have to go back and look at how our students were testing before and how that connects with what we see right now. It's reconciliation of data because we're not going to give them three more assessments. <laughs> We've heard loud and clear, particularly at the elementary level, um, you know, how difficult that is. But at the same time, we want to look at the reliability of it. And so going back to see how our students have performed before, comparing that to now, will help us, one, see those inconsistencies, and two, get a better picture of exactly where they are. Um, so that's a part of what we will continue to do. And, and as we share forward uh, all of the impact of uh, learning as we transition to a virtual learning environment to manage COVID-19, um, because before we've always looked at data from a triangulation of data, and now it's just not all happening at the same time, but going back to prior data that that existed. Yeah, no, I appreciate that because I didn't um, necessarily, my point wasn't so specifically about the, whether or not kids are cheating, it's about the fact that I suspect um, that the data is likely worse than, than what we're seeing. And I just wanna make sure we're remembering that. I, I would like to offer up too that um, our evidence of learning framework is still very much in place. We have identified district level assessments as well in platform as it, uh, specific to English language arts and uh, mathematics. 
So as students take uh, assessments as part of the class day, uh, while there still may be, as you pointed out, um, some assistance provided, we will be able to see through a multiple measures lens whether or not we can confirm the data that we've collected in September or whether we're seeing something very different. And I think time is the adage of time will tell as we get more information on students and they move through the year. So it's, a, it's the same, the multiple measures approach that I know the board has heard about many, many times. Yeah, I appreciate that. When will we see that data? We tr uh, traditionally do another update in February that includes our uh, mid-year data, as well as uh, our graduation data for the class of 20 would be coming in at that time. So there's generally a mid-year report of that. Okay, thank you. So now we will go to um, Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, well, thank you uh, for presenting the data. Although back when we were it, having the conversation about administering the map, I mean, I had to say at the time that some of the data that I thought would come out would be somewhat suspect. We had heard anecdotal information of parents coaching kids uh, at the elementary level. And, you know, I, I, it, it is a useful exercise, although I know that many of our teachers and uh, one of my friends who's a psychologist said, have you guys lost your mind administering this? At this time, it's frustrating. And, you know, the state required us to administer assessments. But, you know, I mean, I have to believe in my heart comparing last year to this year and this year to when we all go back into the buildings, it really is gonna be a matter of comparing apples to oranges because you know our kids did lose in the spring. I mean, no doubt about it, those first two weeks in, that we were closed in March and then attempting to stand up um, immediately a virtual learning experience. It doesn't work for many of our kids, especially our youngest learners. I, and, you know, we, we are all very concerned about children at the third grade being able to read. And I appreciate the efforts uh, and the model exhibited at Burt Mills about what you're doing. And, but we need to be in the buildings for all of those interventions to really work well or most effectively. I know everyone's trying really hard, but there will be a COVID slide. There is going to be a learning loss. And our the big task before us will be how to recover from it, how to help our children. So, you know, I, I realize, you know, we are a data-driven learning organization, but I have to say all of the data to me is somewhat suspect at this time. I'll go to um, Ms. Wolf at this time. I want to associate myself with the comments of Ms. Mandrowski and Ms. O'Neill about the data being a little bit suspect. But my real question is about uh, the program at Burnt Mills. It's operating from 345 to 445 with CARES money. Is that, um, is that a virtual program? That's the first part of the question. And if it is, is there an opportunity to expand that program to other elementary schools where we know the kids are not sort of getting what they need in full during the day because they're not in a brick and mortar building? That's the question. What the pro yes. Um, yes, the program is a virtual program. Um, the before we provide an aftercare program through the CARES Act and it's, it's all virtual, it's after school. You know, at the school day ends at 3.15. So we try to give our little ones a little break before they have to hop back on Zoom at 345 to 445. Mm -hmm. 
um, and we operate four days a week um, instead of five. Um, but yes, it's all virtual. And I will have to say that, you know, it's been, while we do have students and families who are interested in having their um, their students participate in the program, it has been a struggle. It, there have been some difficulties because parents feel like their child already has Zoom fatigue. And to be on Zoom all day from 9 to 3.15 and then um, again from 3.45 to 4.45 for some of our um, youngest learners um, is not something that all parents um, are interested in. But we are encouraging our parents to um, at least give it a try because the the training that our teachers um, have is 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 worthwhile. It's a worthwhile training, and we have seen some some gains in um, the intervention program when we were in the schoolhouse um, last year. You know, Orton Gillingham was. I mean, we were rocking and rolling, and we had parents and teachers who were doing a phenomenal job. And now, you know, in the virtual setting, it is it's, it is very difficult, especially when you're asking a first grader, a six year old to um, stay on Zoom um, an hour beyond the virtual school day. And I do believe um, this program is offered to all elementary schools um, in Montgomery County. Um, okay. And so, yes. Okay, um, thank you. And, and I just wanna say, OG is original gangster in my book. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. And that's what we that's what we call our teachers. They are the real OGs because they really do the job with our little ones. Okay. <laughs> I'm about to say this. Okay, so I'm gonna go back around to make certain members don't have additional questions, and I'm gonna go in the reverse mm -hmm. order. I make up these orders in my head, so y'all just bear with me. So we'll start back with Miss Wolf. I don't have any other questions right now. Thank you. All right. Mrs. O'Neill, did you have another question? Yes, I did. Um, Ms. Okay. Benson, what is the TAWS program? It is the transgender students who are academy for students who are working. So it provides an opportunity for working students to get credits um, towards or, or intern credit as well as completing uh, their coursework in alternative time zone time schedules uh, outside of the school day for students who are working. We have um, successfully accessed that program for our students with about three or four students per year for the last couple of years. It's been very, very supportive and very uh, successful. Okay, great. So we're um, asking questions. We'll go to Mrs. Mondrowski. I'll just wait till the end of the presentation. Or this Dr. next option, sorry. That's okay. Dr. Daka, do you have another comment, question? Or question? Yeah, I I, yes, a comment that I forgot uh, in my notes before, but uh, from Ms. Benson, um, I re really appreciate the fact that your staff follows through with the kids who are going to graduate and really keep after them to make sure that they uh, are fulfilling the requirements that they need and really looking at their um, their life, their career ahead and making sure we're preparing for that. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Dixon. So um, I just really wanted to give a shout out to our students. Um, I really did appreciate today hearing from uh, several of them uh, during the uh, public comments. But, uh, you know, I have to say that, you know, we have, and you know, all know that we have gotten thousands of emails. And I can't remember anything really from a student that, uh, you know, has complained. And so uh, I just think that they have been uh, so resilient and they deserve a lot of thanks for that uh, as well. And Rebecca, I just say that working together, you know, that's called cooperative learning. <laughs> All right, so next we'll hear from um, Ms. Silvestre. Yeah, so I wanted to ask about um, when parents will have access to the map data I think uh, as parents, uh, be very interested to know how our kids did 
this year compared to last year and, and so that they can seek um, additional help and advocate for their children. Um, and related to that, um, Dr. Wilson, uh, isn't there an evidence of learning presentation coming to the board on November 10th as well? I know you, you mentioned the February date to Ms. Madrowski, but isn't there a November 10th date as well? Um, I Not that I'm aware of for evidence of learning. I know that we're having the um, OHRD presentation on that date, um, unless I'm no. behind on my calendaring. I think uh, this is the, the this is the data that we have available to us to present right now. And we don't we don't have the typical multiple measures mm -hmm. because of the the um, lack of an external test. And uh, so we're you know and as Dr. Wilson said, building out more things online. So this is this is what we have available at this time and we'll have more by mid-year, by February. And to your first question about the MAP data being available to parents, Ms. Silvestri, of course, we switched our, um, the, the, to the parent view and we had uh, the MAP reports in our previous uh, parent system and we will be working to provide that data inside of parent view and we're uh, working very diligently uh, to get parents to register for the Parent View account. So, um, if and I don't know, uh, I'll call my colleague Pete. He may know whether they're there at this point in time, but I know that's been part of our uh, work plan to make sure that the data is provided um, to families. Okay, um, and uh, I see that Dr. Smith asked for the grade nine data to be crunched again. Um, when that is presented to the board, could we get an explanation of the methodologies? Because I'm really um, confused. I, I heard you say that there were different methodologies for different grade levels. And so I'm not really understanding what this data means uh, at this point. So. Um, I know you're going to look at the grade nine data to see of the eighth graders that met the 50 percentile, how many of them are meeting the 50 percentile in ninth grade. Um, but just a, a further explanation. Um, sure, we would, we would be happy to do that. It's just that in the other grade levels, because we've had years and years of map data, we're able to look at uh, trends across time in terms of students who make a stop at a particular grade level and what we're seeing they're able to do in relationship to a cohort that's now moved on. So that kind of analysis was done for the majority of the grade levels. We had to approach the ninth grade a little differently because we don't administer it in MAP. And that's why we had to take the snapshot of eighth grade and take a look at the same students in ninth grade. So we will uh, do the initial, the additional analysis for ninth grade um, and explain that um, in the information that we share, the differences. Mr. Sante. Yeah, I have no additional comments. I just our questions. I just wanted to emphasize what's been said about um, the disparities between the eighth grade and the ninth grade data, just thinking back to my own math taking experience, I think um, it being the first time administered on the high school level um, definitely caused some of that downward trend we saw with the data. And yeah, that's that's what I really want to reemphasize. Okay, thank you. So I'll just say, I don't know how you can say anything any different than how my colleagues have said it 14 times going around twice, but I do appreciate having our administrators here um, at every level to explain what's going on in their buildings. Um, so this time I will turn it back over to- um, can I, Ms. Evans, can I just ask one more quick thing? I apologize, but when um, Ms. What Ms. Silvestri mentioned um, and Dr. McKnight, you said you were gonna have um, Pete, um, follow up with it. I didn't know if this was a good time to talk about um, the, com the, you mentioned the parent view and the concerns that um, students and families have had about the 
uh, compatibility and with the particularly with grading issues and things like that of the systems. I don't know if this is an okay time or if you want to wait. I don't, but I just want to see if we could discuss it at some point. Oh, thank you, Ms. Mondrowski. Uh, yes, because the, we can definitely emphasize that. As you know, this year we have had two system. we've, systems. We've pretty much uh, been utilizing Canvas and MyCPS and ParentView. And we are encouraging our parents to continue to use ParentView to get the most updated information on student performance because that is the reliable space in which they can have the most updated information regarding their students, um, grade completion, grades, all of those things. So uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to emphasize that here as well. We can't emphasize that enough and uh, know that our schools will also be continuing to put that message out to our community so that they can be informed about their child's progress. That's great. And I just to emphasize, you all have looked into the concerns that were expressed to us by our students and stuff like that. And we're working on that to make adjustments, right? Yes, absolutely. I know uh, Dr. Wilson, along with some others, have worked with our school principals on uh, looking at models that have worked or that they've set up with their teachers to make sure there is consistency in how the, the grades are being uh, updated and put into the system for easy access for our students and parents as well. Dr. Wilson, I don't know if you wanted to add any particulars on that, but I know she and the school leaders have been working on uh, that since uh, we had our first public comment about that from Mr. King. Yes, we work very closely with the Office of Technology Innovation to make sure that our messaging around uh, really the interactions between uh, Canvas and ParentView and Synergy all take place. And through our daily update process and all through, also through the work that the directors do at, at the school level, uh, we're trying to make sure that the processes are in place and that there's messaging that's clear to our families about where they can find the most reliable information. And Dr. McKnight, I just wanna say again, because I don't think we can overstate it enough, parent view. And if you, any anyone who needs assistance in setting up a parent view, you know, they can reach out to their school, the school counselor, um, you know, the, the technology person at the school, they can reach out to central office, reach out to me, we'll get you, uh, we'll get you on that parent view because uh, it uh, has a wealth of information and it is the most accurate information. Can I just jump in? Because uh, I had shared emails with you uh, or an email and then a verbal conversation. While well, we've been talking about high school, there is still, there's been a concern at the elementary and you emphasize the need for parent view um, because there's a disconnect, I guess, between the uh, uh, completed assignments and on Canvas versus Parent View, and you promised me that you will be having local school leaders communicating with parents. Correct. That is correct, Miss O'Neill. Uh, we've recognized that multiple communications around this can do nothing but help. We have sent out several communications from the central level around this, but Dr. Wilson will be working with all of our school leaders on including that in their uh, uh, weekly updated messages to their communities to remind them to use Parent View, make sure they have all the information that they need to help us transition to uh, them being comfortable with using just that system. Right. So we have one more comment before you go on. Um, Dr. Daka would like to ask. Yes, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to thank Dr. Wilson for bringing up the cohorts issue because always when we look at the statistics, sometimes it's not the same group that we're looking at. And I think it's really important that they're looking at the eighth grade and then looking at some of the ninth graders, um, maybe not as extensive in the testing, but at least they're comparing the same kids uh, one year weeks apart or months apart. And the other thing I, I wanted to say, I agree with um, Ms. Dixon about cooperative learning, and I know she smiled about that, but that's a serious thing. We have ethnic groups in this country and elsewhere who believe that group learning is so important. And the thing that is important is that the students get the materials. And there are other groups that feel that it's a one-on-one -on -one competition uh, in terms of learning. And I just wanted to point out that we have learning groups in 
this country that do compare the work. They prepare together. And I just think of law students. We've heard about the study groups that they have, and there are other groups that have study groups together so that the kids can learn. So I think the important thing is that somehow they master the, uh, the information. Thanks. Okay. So we can continue on with the presentation. Ms. Evans, if I could. Yes. I would just like to thank uh, Dr. Ashton, Ms. Benson, and Ms. Joranby for all of your efforts. Really appreciate uh, everything you're doing and all of your colleagues across the school system. I was uh, on a meeting yesterday with some principals and one of them made the point, and I think it's a powerful point, that no one, and I was a, a principal for 15 years and an assistant principal for three years, but I was never a principal during a pandemic. I wasn't, and I thought it was a powerful point that one of the principals made, or, you know, it just, we're all trying to figure this out, and all of us at the central office who have lots of different experiences need to remember those experiences are not the same as what we're doing now, and I often feel that as a superintendent uh, when I'm working with, uh, you know, the state agency and others that this, this is uh, no small thing, so I sincerely appreciate you, uh, Dr. Ashton, Ms. Dranby, and Ms. Benson, for everything you're doing right now, and all of your colleagues, too, that you represent here today. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Evans, do you mind if I make one more remark about MAP? Um, I did get a clarification, and uh, the MAP reports I, will be available in November. Um, we did just finish the testing about the second week in October, as Dr. McKnight said, it started in September and went about six weeks. So I just wanted to take this opportunity since I know there's lots of viewers to say that November um, is, is the time that we'll have those reports in there. And I know, I know we'll do some messaging around it. Okay. If it's okay, Ms. Evans, we will continue on. We're now going to move into a discussion with Dr. Sergo and Dr. Lewis on how they have worked with many other teams and gotten lots of feedback about adjustments to Wednesday. So at this time, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. It's nice to see everybody this evening. Uh, we do have some slides to go with our presentation this evening that you should be able to see on your screen. So uh, it's Hello again to everybody. My name is Dr. Sarah Sergo. I'm one of the directors of Learning Achievement and Administration in the Office of Teaching, Learning and Schools. And along with one of my co-leads on the elementary recovery team, Dr. Brenda Lewis, who is the director of Pre-K-12 Curriculum, we return to you today as part of our commitment to the Board of Education, to our employees, our students, and our families to collect feedback and revisit the elementary virtual learning schedule. As we came to you in August a number of times, we remain committed to equity and excellence, and we believe that serving our most vulnerable students must guide our decisions. This has and will continue to be the compass for our work as educators. Next slide. <clears throat> On August 25th, the Board of Education approved the elementary virtual learning schedule, a sample of which is depicted here on the screen that we launched for the first marking period. And nine weeks have passed since August 25th, and we have had time to live with the schedule and understand how it is being experienced by our students, our staff, and our families. Next slide. In addition to the system-wide survey around virtual learning, our team spent time collecting and analyzing feedback about the elementary schedule. As the launch of the 100% online learning schedule and the English language arts and math curriculum was a system-wide effort, we wanted to spend time this fall allowing that work to unfold. So in October, we wanted to get a sense of really closely looking at what was working well, areas to consider, and propose potential areas of refinement. So throughout October, we met with a number of representative stakeholder groups, including the Deputy Superintendent's Advisory Committee, the Family Engagement Action Team, our elementary principals and assistant principals, as well as our school-based staff. We spent a lot of time talking with our teachers, the councils for teaching and learning and other teachers on our elementary recovery committee. 
This timeline in October was focused on allowing us to plan for, communicate, and ideally launch any potential changes by the start of the second marking period on November 10th. So in meeting with these groups, we heard from over 200 stakeholders, 80% of the feedback was from our staff living this schedule every day, our teachers and our school-based administrators. And of those, they felt that it was really important for us to take a look closely at the schedule. So we asked this focus sample of staff what was working well in the areas to consider where we might wanna adjust. And of our respondents, 75% thought it was important to make a change. Of those who felt we should stay the course, they pointed out to a number of things working well. So while you see on the screen the areas of feedback, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the tremendous effort of our teachers and school-based staff to launch this work. They talked to us about the positive experiences with daily class meetings, the social emotional work, as well as the schedule and routine of logging on each day. There was a lot of praise for the connection that our staff are having with families, the long midday break, and the increased time to plan on Wednesday afternoons and work together. But of those who felt we should make changes, these were the areas of note that they wanted us to attend to. We asked them about a variety of changes we might make. Some were about looking at the minutes of instruction. Some were looking at what content areas we may wanna prioritize or look at what's taught, as well as adjusting the live instruction and use of time on Wednesdays. 60% of those we spoke with felt that looking at live instruction and reimagining the time on Wednesdays was the priority. So we asked for them to propose ways of addressing those interests. We have received a lot of really thoughtful responses and many innovative contributions from our teachers and our leaders about how to address these three key areas. Next slide. The week following our MCPS board meeting on August 25th, there was a Maryland State Board of Education meeting where the following student engagement expectations were adopted. And as you can see, there are two bulleted items framed here that are germane to our conversation today because we have to recognize the boundaries of any potential refinements and the understanding of any adjustment that we would recommend must ensure we continue to meet these state expectations around the amount of instruction that must occur live on average each day and the, and the necessary requirement that schools must have a six hour per day experience. Next slide. So we're now gonna to present to you our recommendation for the board to consider, next slide. Based on the feedback and the constraints for our elementary virtual learning schedule, we come to you today to propose a shift in how we look at the instructional model for Wednesday mornings that we believe will support our students, families, and our staff. As we worked with our teachers and leaders to refine this recommendation, you can see the varied interests that we attempted to address. And as we walk through this presentation today, we will return to these interests to show you exactly how we believe we've been able to meet them in our proposal. Next slide. First image, click, thank you. The image above displays our proposed adjustment to how we would structure and experience Wednesday mornings at the elementary level. What you see in green here really captures the changes and I'm gonna walk you through them briefly and then Dr. Lewis is going to talk specifically about each block. What you see is that we do maintain focus on learning during that nine o'clock to 11.30 morning block, but we have increased the flexibility and use of time, including increased teacher planning time. Let me show a few key features I want to point out. The morning schedule continues with the routine for our staff and families that have indicated is very helpful where classes log in together at 9 a.m. This initial 30 minute block would be used for attendance, which we know is an important priority, that morning meeting to connect and frame the day, and it would continue to be a space for social emotional learning and community building. That's an essential structure for our classroom communities. This gives educators uninterrupted class meeting time that we know they value. We will no longer hold live benchmark literacy and Eureka math instruction on Wednesday mornings, but we have created in place of it two learning blocks. To our teachers, we wanna make sure those of you listening to know that the pacing guides will be adjusted. And certainly we know that when teachers hear about adjustments in the Eureka and Benchmark, that's the first thing they think about. And we know that that work is going to occur. 
Block one, which you see here noted as teacher directed learning experiences, is when teachers will still lead this work and engage real time with our students. Block two, teachers will be released for planning and students will be guided to complete work either on their own, receive services or paraeducator support. These blocks were connected to our content area learning goals in reading, writing and math and other areas. If you could just go back for a moment, want to point out something that's an important feature. At the end of the first block, students will return to their classroom and check in to have closure. And at the end, at the start of block two, our teachers will be released for planning. The selection of 1030 AM launches that additional hour of planning time and its placement adjacent to the lunch and wellness break was deliberate because then it creates potential opportunities for extended planning time for our teachers. The afternoon schedules in our schools will remain unchanged. They will not be disrupted to reduce the challenges with master scheduling and staffing that would result if we shift the entire day. That means that specials on Wednesday afternoons may continue as to not further impact our school master scheduling. Both blocks are not a time for new learning. The intention is to give teachers a menu of options that would re require minimal planning, but rather require preparation and give our teachers an opportunity to design learning experiences for our students. And last, we just wanna note that for our pre-K staff, families and educators, or for those who are pursuing alternate learning outcomes, we do have versions of this that are developed for those particular groups that are designed with teacher and leader input to ensure parity across all of our school and program models. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Lewis, who will go through this next image and walk you through some examples of each block. Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Dr. Sergo. One more click on this slide, please. And here you actually see a close-up of what you saw earlier on the previous slide. As Dr. Sergo shared, from 9 to 9.30, we will start just as we do every other morning of the week with that morning meeting from 9 to 9.30, and then is our block one time. And that's from 9.30 to 10.15, and this is teacher-directed time. And our recovery team, um, comprised about, of about 85 members, was able to generate some really good thinking around a menu of options that we can provide to our schools so that our leadership teams can use that menu of options to really design and think through and have in place grade level banded options. This block one is also a time for our students to receive teacher, para, or related services support. Then as a reminder, our students will come back whole group from 10.15 to 10.30. And this is a time to have closure from their morning, but also to launch them into block number two, which is the guided student work time, as well as student support time. And during block two, our students will be engaged in self-guided content from a variety of resources that um, we have curated through MCPS. Next slide, please. And here you can see the details of block one laid out. Again, it's a time for extension, enrichment, exploration, review, reteaching. As Dr. Sergo said, this is not a time for new learning, but rather a time to work within those areas. And our grade level teams will be able to identify and guide students in the completion of developmentally appropriate activities, as well as learning experiences from the menu of options. And some of the options that came up in the menu we're utilizing the benchmark advanced daily calendar as well as the enrichment units. Other options that came up were resources such as Khan Academy and Zern Math. Another piece that we heard <laughs> that came up numerous times, specifically among our third through fifth grade educators, was saying we can use this time to work with our students on assignment completion. So this gives both our teachers and our students that time that they need to get in those exit tickets, the problem sets, to complete their work that potentially they have as outstanding or missed assignments. Our teachers will communicate the learning plan for our students during this block of time as part of framing the day for our, start, 
for our students. And during this time, teachers will work with some of our students live, while others may be on their own or receiving support. So a wide variety of different ways in which students are engaged. Next slide, please. This is our block two. And as a reminder, this is from 1030 to 1130, immediately following our 1015 to 1030 whole class time, where our students are closing out for the morning and then also their teachers are working with them to really launch into these learning choice boards. And this is an active site that is ready to go that uh, you can actually begin clicking in. It's open um, for families and students and teachers to be able to see the different resources that we have. And this is curated resources that we have available in MCPS. And some of the examples are streaming of content through our Discovery Education partners, as well as our partnership with Montgomery County Public Libraries. You'll also see a big hit that we had with um, our Summer Adventures on Your Own program this summer with virtual field trips. We also have resources such as Pebble Go that we have on here as well. We also have uh, virtual maker spaces, as well as our outdoor education staff has prepared outdoor experiences for our students to participate in as well. We also are working with Kid Museum to bring um, enrichment during the block to to some of our elementary students as well. So this is the variety of resources and learning choice boards that our students will have from the 1030 to 1130 time where they are engaging in these resources while our teachers are able to have that prep and planning time. And I did want to emphasize what Dr. Sergo shared um, in the very beginning, that should this recommendation move forward, our curriculum teams stand ready to um, revise our pacing guides and our guidance to schools to reflect for English language arts and math to have the four days of live teaching rather than the five. So we don't want our teachers and our school staff to be nervous that the pacing won't be adjusted. So should this through, we will definitely give to you um, adjusted resources to reflect four days of live teaching versus five. I will now turn it back to Dr. Sergo. Next slide. So in summary, we return to the interests that we aim to achieve in making an adjustment to the schedule. And while we acknowledge that the reduction in live instruction and what would be taught and learned in literacy math content at the elementary level is not ideal, we feel that addressing these interests is an essential next step in supporting our students, staff, and families. We are able to continue to meet the MSDE live instruction requirements particularly when you look at both of these blocks and the menu of options that we have crowdsourced with our teachers and our leaders, there are a number of developmentally appropriate options for reducing screen time. So not all of the things that happen in these blocks are in the screen or on the computer. We've been able to increase teacher planning time on Wednesdays and also to our related service providers, our occupational therapists, physical therapists, speech therapists, and our special educators. They will have increased options of serving students as they had not primarily been able to do so during that Wednesday morning block. The other thing that we think is important around our values is that we keep all of our content areas intact. When you look at social studies, science, art, music, and PE, those are the kinds of subjects that often come up when people talk about prioritizing literacy and math. And we're really pleased that we continue to make those important content areas priorities in our virtual learning. It also encourages in daily attendance. Our elementary schools are doing a phenomenal job getting kids engaged and coming to class each and every day. And we think that habit is an important aspect of our success with our schedule. And last, it dedicates time for students to complete assignments. There'll be additional support block options, and it'll also give them an opportunity to engage with teachers or other staff to help them achieve their learning goals. So at this time, we would turn it back to the board with any questions about what we've presented. Thank you for the presentation. I'll start with Ms. Dixon and then go to Dr. Daka after Ms. Dixon. Great. So uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Um, I um, was just uh, interested um, 
in terms of the revised schedule. Um, is, is this something that um, the principals, the elementary principals agreed to? Um, is there any flexibility in that schedule um, in the morning, especially? Uh, I, I appreciate that there seems to be maybe another hour uh, of teacher planning time, but, but let me just ask you uh, those two questions, uh, your response uh, to those. Did, how, did, how did the elementary principals feel about this schedule, and uh, is there any flexibility in it? So thank you for that question. So all of our elementary administrators, both principals and assistant principals, had an opportunity to give feedback. Um, we also have two elementary principals who are the chairs of the elementary principals PLC who are on our design team and gave us feedback and refinements, as well as having our two elementary councils on teaching and learning co-chairs who are also on our design leads team. And we've invited them since school started to join us on that leads work to weigh in and really have this be a shared effort. Um, so in terms of involvement or opportunities to weigh in, we, we feel that that's been robust and both for both groups. In terms of your question about flexibility, that is actually inherently the design principle that we're after. We really wanna return that flexibility to the level of the classroom and our grade level teachers and our teams. And we say, what is it that you think this time block should look like? What are, these are the menu of options that we've curated for you, both in terms of potential recommendations by grade level band, but also just in terms of resources. And you know, you're experts, you're professionals, and we wanna give you that design opportunity with respect to what occurs during those two blocks. So, Oh, okay, so if a school wanted to, um, let's say, uh, redesign that somewhat, um, let's say they wanted to have, you know, the cell uh, lessons first, you know, from maybe 9 to 9.30, uh, then have, um, you know, uh, the teacher-directed lessons from 9.30 to 10.30, uh, and maybe their specials bring those from the afternoon to the morning from 1030 to 11, uh, 15. Uh, and then, uh, you know, students would be involved in asynchronous learning in the afternoon and the afternoon time the teachers would have for uh, increased planning. Is that something that a school could could do? Could they s switch that around? Ms. Dixon, I will chime in here. Um, just as we did with the um, original uh, proposed schedule, we knew that based on staffing levels within schools, based on the support that, say, for instance, Title I schools have, um, based on the intervention programs and models they, they, stand, they need to stand up on behalf of their students, that within those timeframes, there is certainly flexibility. I think one of the things that we heard from many parents was the importance of that teacher coming on first thing in the morning uh, because that elementary circle time in a, you know, in a brick or mortar school to develop right. class community is so important uh, that that was one of the things that we, we know that we need to be insistent about uh, because the kids depend on that. We need to take attendance. But just as we did with the original schedule, we know that we have some schools that have adjusted the way they approach and the timing of the way they approach the um, blocks for Eureka and Benchmark. And I, I certainly know that the schools can work with their directors. Um, but one of the other things that we know is that there's a wide amount of variance across schools then right. sometimes our community will compare and it becomes an issue and a, and a concern. So we do like to give these parameters um, so that schools can operate in, within those. But certainly we know that it can't be lockstep minute by minute um, in terms of the school's flexibility. Right. So they could tinker with it if they wanted uh, to. Yeah, my concern is that, you know, we get uh, actually on Twitter every week uh, mm -hmm. uh, from a teacher who, elementary teacher who shares with us uh, how many hours, um, you know, over 
uh, time uh, she's spending. And it seems like, you know, it's like another full week, you know, in terms of time preparing, uh, you know, almost another 40 hours uh, preparing. Um, so, uh, so you are saying that there is some flexibility that uh, schools could have uh, in terms of that. Uh, just in terms of what they might need. Yes, Ms. Dixon, um, just as we did in the previous, uh, when we put out the previous template, we certainly have to have certain minutes of instruction for math, right, English right. language arts and so forth. And the other thing I wanted to mention um, also about the principal input is Dr. McKnight and I, we actually had a listening session with the elementary principals. Um, and, and they just basically shared their experiences, the good and, and the, the things that they thought that we could uh, improve upon. And then also uh, uh, Dr. Sergo and Dr. Lewis um, did an office hours with principals then that following Friday. So there were two opportunities within one week. And what I liked about that was after uh, Dr. McKnight and I had the, our listening session, they had about 48 hours to think again and to share again in office hours any additional thoughts they might have. So I would say that we had maximum participation uh, from our principals. And, and quite frankly, there was a, a great deal of work done to, to get the teacher input um, also in, in terms of these revisions. And, you know, this is difficult work. Uh, we've never done this before. So, you know, when we, we try, we committed at the start to say that we would revisit it and, you um, I, I think we've done a, a uh, I think the staff has done a very thorough job um, at touching base with many, many stakeholders. Ms. Dixon, just to echo that, there were 105 elementary principals that came to the listening session, 105. Yes. And we really did just that, listen and hear lots of input. And one of the things I'll highlight about that conversation was every single one of those principals, not all 105 spoke, but the had it organized in terms of how the things that were shared with us were representative of the collective of that group, all represented lots of the voices that came from their teachers um, and, and making sure that that was represented in what they were, were raising to us. So I, I, it was one of the most powerful experiences um, we've had in terms of engagement and really hearing the connection between the principal's leadership and what they hear from their teachers. And most importantly, what we also learned was Many of them were saying, based on our school, we have to be able to make adjustments in the schedule. And some had already began to do that. And mm -hmm. we had a chance to hear how all of this plays out differently in different schools based on the need. And that's essentially what they were asking for for themselves and their teachers. So uh, again, the parameters being there and in terms of what we, we have to do and providing that flexibility was key. Yeah. I think just an interesting piece, and then I'll stop here. It would be now uh, that, you know, we've presented, you know, the revised schedule uh, to go back and ask them, uh, are you okay with this? Will, will this meet your school's needs? I, I think that's a really important uh, question. And, you know, as Dr. Wilson said, uh, you know, they can certainly uh, work with their directors, uh, you know, if they feel uh, they need something else, but um, so I'll just, I, I do think that it would be a good idea to go back now and say, okay, how many of you are good with this? And, uh, you know, just to give yourselves that information. Okay, thank you very much. Dr. Daco. Um, I don't have anything at this time. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Asante. I don't have anything either. Thank you for the presentation. I, I, uh, well, actually, I did want to comment on just real quickly how um, earlier when we heard about this, I guess my concern was the fact that um, elementary school teachers would um, have to be, have to come up with these additional lessons themselves. So I was glad to see that you guys are providing those resources for them. Ms. Wolf. I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for this because as we said at the beginning that we would take a look at it. And so I'm really glad that we followed through on our commitment to go back and take a look at what was being done and make adjustments as necessary. And thank you for giving me a little break on Wednesday too. <laughs> 
Also, I do agree with, with Miss Dixon. I do think, uh, you know, maybe after about four weeks of this, you should circle back around and see if it's working to their satisfaction of the way they thought that it would. Thank you. Ms. Sylvestre. Um, thank you. I, I wanted to ask uh, if this will start, uh, if you mentioned it, I missed it. it. Will this start with the new marking period? And how will the block two time be accounted for? Is it uh, optional? Will it be, will teachers know if, if students completed something? Sure, those are great, great questions. Thanks, Ms. Silvestri. So our plan is for this to start marking period two. And as far as block number two, just like we have always been committed to having flexibility for our students and families, we would highly encourage guide our students into those activities um, and they're built in such a way too that if a student is unable to do those during 10 30 to 11 30 they can certainly do those at other times also if they get really excited and want to visit it at other times in addition to 10 30 to 11 30 they can do that as far as grading or any sort of actions of that nature that's not how they're designed so students won't have to be completing assignments there to go for grades or credit okay thank you Ms. Silvestri, uh, we, we are looking uh, to start this the second at the beginning of the second quarter. Uh, and one part of what I wanted to circle back to is a part of why we wanted to have the principals elevating the teacher's needs, which then elevates the student's need in this discussion, is because we actually want there to be ownership at the school level of these changes. Um, and so as we go back and have the conversation with them about how are things working, um, it really will be, and we want it to be, a result of what they have been able to come up with um, in terms of what are the adjustments that are needed at their school level and for their students. So I just wanted to, to elevate that um, as the comments earlier were also about the process of checking back in. So essentially it really is checking in within your own uh, you know, practices or, or adjustments that have been made. But we will definitely uh, share that back with the board um, as we will have to be thoughtful about how we support our schools as they make these changes and transitions, because we'll right. learn well. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and one one really important thing I think I want to make mention of, um, you know, in, in terms of the flexibility piece, you know, we we worked really hard to make sure that our other content areas were not um, interrupted. You know, science, social studies, and our um, resources, our specials, and so those are that. In particular, the specials are one place where we really do have to stay the course because it does affect the schedules in other schools. Um, whenever the, the specials are scheduled on a Wednesday, they, they, really, need, they really need to stay there uh, because it will become a disruption to others. So that would be one of the areas where we would certainly want schools to stay the course because we don't want changes to take that opportunity away from our students. Um, and to be additive, um, I, we, want, we do have a communication that is going out to our school leaders, uh, if not this evening in the morning, that will re-explain everything that we presented. Um, they'll have it, they were, they're going to be asked to share that information with their entire staff to bring total transparency to the design principles, to um, all of the different approaches, and then um, set some deadlines for them to provide updates to their community. Uh, we're gonna be using Quick Notes uh, with the public information office. Some information would go out then uh, on our, many of our schools are doing Sunday messages. And then really the next level beyond that for a parent would be hearing directly from their classroom teacher where we know those immediate connections occur. So we recognize that we have about 10 days or maybe two weeks, if you will, um, to get this launched. Um, and we know like with anything else that the first week may look different than the second. Um, uh, but when we've talked with our teachers and our teacher leaders who helped us to do this design work, um, they felt like um, teachers are going to be excited and eager to get this going and felt like this was something um, that we could tackle and take on together. Thank you, we'll hear from Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, thank you uh, for reviewing um, because planning time has been a concern from the get-go. 
Um, and no doubt about it, it takes more time in this virtual world than anyone could have anticipated. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's, it, it's an incremental increase. It's not a huge amount of time, but I'm sure that it will be put to good use by teachers. Um, I, well, I know it will be. And actually, I think students can have the opportunity to complete assignments too um, and take a little breather. Because I think especially for our youngest learners, it's a long day on with virtual learning. Your first bullet was about the MSDE requirements, and you're absolutely certain that we're meeting not only the letter, but the spirit of their requirements? Yes, at this, at this point in time, we, we do. The, the average is a 3.5 by on a K-12 um, of synchronous uh, daily and we do meet that even with these adjustments um you know and i know that that's an ongoing discussion in terms of how uh you know the calendar plays out relative to the virtual space um you know at the state level but um, we do meet the requirements as we know them right now and just an editorial comment you know i mean i appreciate you going back and revising the pacing guides on Eureka and Benchmark, um, but we know that kids have lost some, you know, there's been a COVID slide. We talked about it when we looked at the map data. So, you know, we don't want to lose, you know, any portion of the year's worth of learning in Eureka or Benchmark. Mrs. Spondrowski. So thank you. So um, thanks for the, the work you all are doing on this. I think the fact that we are um, making changes um, makes it clear that our youngest are struggling. Um, they need in-person learner learning sooner than later. Um, but I'm grateful that while we're doing this, we're trying to make adjustments to provide um, the best experiences that our students and our staff um, can have. Um, similar to um, you know, uh, some, some of my colleagues here, I, uh, I think it's clearly Ms. Stigson and I have spoken to some of the sa sim same advocates um, or with their concerns. Um, so I do agree that we need to continue to check back um, on this. Um, unfortunately, the one slide was not included in our materials anywhere. So um, I thought this was just going to be, I thought the change was it was only a morning period, uh, only a morning section, because the only slide I had showed block one and block two. Um, but so, you know, and now I'm not, I haven't had time to process what it's going to be like, but I find it concerning maybe having specials in the mornings, I mean, in the afternoons, because I'm not sure that if there's, the lunch break that kids will log back on. Um, I don't want to lose any um, meaningful teacher-led time. Um, our students need that. And I know that in the mornings, they tend our students um, tend to be more focused. Um, so I think that if, you know, I'm hopeful that schools can really um, have the flexibility to be able to make changes that work best for them. Um, and um, that is pretty much it. So just like I said, I hope um, that we can, I know that there were some parents who were concerned um, about it as well, but I'm assuming they hadn't seen this extra slide either. So, um, so I just let's just keep following up and making sure that um, we're being responsible about checking out whether or not this works for our schools and our, our students, most importantly, and then our families and our staff as well. So thank you. Okay, so we'll allow you to continue with the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Evans, at this point, um, uh, listening to the conversation, I'm going to interpret this so that we have a consensus of the board to move forward with this schedule change. 
Um, and so unless I hear differently, then we're going to uh, continue implementing it. Uh, you know, going back to the original, as Ms. Wolf referenced, we said all along we were going to look at everything. And the other thing we all have to keep in mind is, uh, you know, we're probably going to have some form of virtual learning for the foreseeable future. Uh, even if we're able to go back into a, uh, you know, a physical space for uh, growing numbers of kids throughout the rest of this year, because as we've all been contacted, uh, a lot of our families have circumstances, health circumstances in their home that are going to re require uh, prolonged virtual learning. So we want to continue to perfect the virtual learning uh, as a platform that um, families uh, may have to choose because of their own circumstances. So, you know, it's not, it, it's about making it all work for all students and all families. So, okay. Right. So that was a consensus from the board to move yep. forward with the recommendations that you see. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Dr. McKnight. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, we will now turn it over to Mr. Turner. We are going to give some updates around metrics and how that plays into our continued conversation moving forward about bringing uh, students back safely when it is uh, appropriate to do so. Mr. Turner. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Uh, before I begin, I just want to make it clear to our community that I'm not a medical doctor or a health policy expert, uh, though I am part of the team that works closely with our county health officials to ensure the health and safety of our students and staff. Uh, so with that out of the way, um, MCPS is closely following the COVID-19 health metrics in our county and state, as well as monitoring the trends across the nation. We have a first slide, please. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by sharing a screenshot of the recently redesigned Montgomery County COVID surveillance dashboard. The dashboard is more closely aligned with the CDC guidance for dynamic school decision making. Uh, as the county's dashboard shows, there are two primary indicators for and four secondary indicators. I will focus on the primary indicators at this time, but if folks want to view the full dashboard, uh, you can see it at montgomerycountymd.gov backslash COVID-19. Uh, for primary indicator one, the seven-day average for new cases per 100,000 residents, the dashboard shows that we are at a high risk of transmission. As of today, our county had an average of 11.9 cases per 100,000. Uh, to put this in context, on August 31, the first day of the school year, we had a rate of 6.3 uh, per 100,000 residents. Uh, for the second uh, primary indicator, the 14-day test positivity, uh, the data shows we are at very low risk of transmission. Uh, the current rate is 3.1%. Again, for context, on August 31st, the positivity rate was 2.5%. Um, next slide, please. It's important to point out that the new case rate is an average of the entire county. As you can see from the screenshot of the new positive cases by zip code, there are areas in our county that have an average case rate of 25 per 100,000 residents and areas that have an average rate of two per 100,000 uh, residents. Uh, so just that, that big uh, gap in terms of, of rate across our 500 square miles. I also want to share that the State Board of Education announced yesterday that is developing a dashboard slash scorecard that will look at infection rates, uh, safety protocols, PPE in classrooms, uh, student surveys, teacher surveys, uh, equity as a function of uh, access to a device and broadband, athletics, and of, cur of course, uh, first term uh, performance metrics. Um, as we have shared, MCPS is actually working on our own dashboard uh, for our website. Uh, though based on recent changes to the county dashboard and the state dashboard, uh, we're actually revising our dashboard to be better aligned. Um, that said, I do want to share two important pieces of data that will be included on the MCPS dashboard about our employees. First, uh, since March 16, 2020, 108 employees have tested positive for COVID-19. Second, uh, 18 employees are currently quarantined after testing positive. So those are two key numbers that I think uh, our community uh, needs to know. Um, next slide, please. 
As we've said, MCPS is committed to the health and safety of our students and staff and the continued academic progress of our students. We have been regularly engaging with our county health officials as we consider next steps for teaching and learning during the pandemic. The chart on the slide is a health matrix, matrix health metrics matrix uh, for a phased in return to in-person instruction based on CDC guidelines and in consultation with county health officials. Like the state's reopening guidance, we have, uh, as we've previously shared, uh, this matrix is, matrix is based on a 14-day test positivity of less than 5%. The matrix lays out a phased-in approach that provides for more in-person opportunities as health metrics improve. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, you'll see on the chart it says student special populations. I, I want to make sure that special populations is not meant to be confused with special education. Rather, it's a uh, we consider special populations as students facing extraordinary challenges to virtual learning caused by COVID-19. As Dr. Smith mentioned, we will be returning to the board uh, on both November 6th and November 10th to discuss our strategy for a gradual, safe reopening that is aligned with these new guidance documents. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to Dr. Smith to talk about enrollment. Next slide, please. So we've shown you lots of enrollment and yesterday during the capital budget work session, we discussed this and I just wanted to highlight it again today. This indicates on September 30th, our official enrollment count date that we were just under 2,700 K through 12 students lower than we were a year ago, September 30th, our official count date. That's going to have a significant effect, not only on our local funding through the maintenance of effort law, but also a significant effect on state funding, most likely. And so uh, while we're concerned about this um, and concerned that all of our children are getting uh, the best services possible in this strange environment, we're also concerned about how we continue to have the resources that we need to uh, meet the needs of the students um, to the best of our ability at this time. Uh, their learning needs, their well-being needs, their need for uh, lunches and breakfast, their needs for technology and connectivity, and their needs for curriculum materials and uh, additional support after school, as you heard Dr. Ashton uh, explain and, and Dr. Wilson uh, across all elementary and uh, elementary schools and uh, our adult needs for adult learning, uh, for return to in-person school, but also how to use the virtual platform to the very best of our ability. All of these are new things, uh, but that's the, the point I wanted to make today about our K-12 enrollment. As you can see with our pre-K um, right here, what the enrollment is, th this represents about 1,000 fewer students in pre-K at this point this year than we had last year. And we're also very concerned because the uh, you know, blueprint for Maryland's future, what's commonly called the Kerwin funding, will affect our general operating budget. It will also affect our ability to offer pre-K programs and many other areas as that uh, those funds are very much at risk. And I will turn it back to Dr. McKnight. Thank you. We have a couple more updates in this section before we open it up for a discussion with the board. Um, we'll have Mr. Chevanini give us an update on the numbers uh, when it comes down to connectivity. And then Mr. Uh, Neff will also give us an update around engagement. And then we'll close out with some brief updates around um, athletics from Dr. Sullivan. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Uh, this slide shows the updated connectivity numbers of our students. We measure whether students can connect to our virtual education environment by their ability to connect to either MindSpace Classroom or one of their Zoom classes. By this report, since the last report that we gave, we have decreased the number of students not connecting by 25% from 1,561 to one. 1,139. The schools and student support teams have done an amazing job working with these students. From the 16th to now, though, they've even done more work, 
bringing that number down another 12% to under 1,000, with more being taken off the list every day. I will now turn it over to Mr. Steve Neff, who will, uh, uh, who will share how schools are using the connectivity data to reach out to students. Steve? Thank you, Mr. Chevanini. Good evening, Dr. Smith and members of the Board of Education. Thank you for having me again. I'm pleased to be able to share with you some data pulled on October 18th that speaks to the work of the student well-being teams. The now slightly under 1,000 yet to engage students on the previous slide are a subset of all of the students and families that have been discussed by student well-being teams. Now, some of these data do not exactly add up to the total number of cases because this tool has been designed to be a working document where data and information is added as outreach and interventions occur. Can we get the next slide, please? Uh, I'm sorry, thank you. These data indicate that 78% of the cases discussed by student well-being teams were cases where attendance and engagement were the primary concern. 57% of the students discussed by student well-being teams are Hispanic, 41% are li limited English proficient, and 69% receive free and reduced meals. Roughly one-third of the concerns had been resolved at the time of this data poll, while two-thirds continued to be worked on. SSI directors have been following up with their schools to help strategize around those families who have been hard to engage. Success stories have been reported through the narrative portion of this data collection tool, such as families who have responded when the principal themselves makes the outreach call or when a virtual home visit is conducted that have helped to increase the engagement of specific students. Many schools are reporting that their student well-being teams are being further broken down into grade level teams so that specific staff members are targeting specific groups of students for outreach and interventions. The challenge remains, however, those families who have truly gone underground and have not yet been responsive to staff members' numerous and varied outreach attempts. Outreach efforts continue for those families. I will now turn it over to Dr. Jeff Sullivan yes. and Dr. Smith to provide a brief update on athletics. Thank you, Mr. Neff. Good evening, everyone. I wanna provide a brief update on state guidance regarding interscholastic athletics and our efforts here in MCPS athletics. Yesterday, the State Board of Education approved a new athletics calendar for school systems in the two semester plan of operations. This change impacts MCPS and 20 other school districts in Maryland and moves the new start date for winter sports practices from February 1 to December 7th. The change was made to resolve concerns with the previous calendar, including eliminating a two week overlap between the seasons, which impacted students and coaches, allowing for longer seasons and the ability for student athletes to recondition and prepare and minimizing facility and field conflicts. In the near future, we are expecting the MPSSAA, our state athletic association to release operating procedures and considerations for winter sports. In the meantime, after a successful fall virtual season, we kicked off our second virtual season yesterday with the start of winter virtual sports. Additionally, the COVID-19 task force for MCPS athletics has been busy planning for the return of in-person activities. The task force includes representation from the Montgomery County Department of Health and Human Services an Office of Emergency Management and Homeland Security, along with a variety of stakeholders across MCPS. This includes representation from our friends in fine arts and extracurricular activities. Our programs continue to work collaboratively for the, for the planning of return for in-person activities. So the COVID-19 Task Force will review the latest guidelines from the State Board of Education and the MPSSA regarding winter sports and has already begun examining the implications for MCPS. We will be providing recommendations for consideration regarding the return of in-person activities in the coming weeks. We look forward to the return of in-person activities when health metrics allow and in alignment with the return of students to schools. 
In closing, I want to highlight the efforts of our coaches, athletic specialists, staff in our central athletics unit, and leaders across all of MCPS athletics who are supporting our students as athletes, students, and upstanding citizens in our communities. I also wanna highlight our student athletes for their continued resiliency and commitment to excellence. Now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Smith. So the conversation uh, around our athletics and activities program will continue on November 6th. Uh, over the next few days, there'll be a lot of discussion and interpretation about the uh, state board's decision yesterday, just as when they made the rather abrupt decision or the governor and state superintendent did around October 7th, back at the end of September. And so we'll come back on uh, November 6th and November 10th as we discuss uh, concrete steps toward reopening. And uh, Dr. Sullivan, who I see has his Howard University gear on today where he got his PhD recently, um, uh, he will be there to talk very specifically about that along with uh, Ms. Cherry and all of our many staff members that we see at all of these uh, board meetings. So uh, uh, it's an fast moving time with lots of sudden changes, but we're flexible and we will make it work for our students. Uh, Dr. McKnight, any final thoughts before we uh, turn it no, back? No, Dr. Smith, you, you, you definitely covered it. Thank you so much. Um, this is an overview of where we are with all of the recovery of education efforts uh, from virtual learning to all of the other components to support our students. At this time, Ms. Evans, we will turn it over to you for board discussion. Sure, I'll just go in the reverse order. Um, Mrs. Smodrowski was the last person to ask a question, so I'll just start with you. I don't think I really have any questions. I appreciate the information. Thank you. Sure. Mrs. O'Neill. Yes, um, I, I had two questions, but uh, one, um, Derek, thank you for the information. I look forward to the metrics uh, Put out by the state. I parents say, you know, when they ask what is the plan, they're saying, when will my children go back? But certainly it all has to be determined by health metrics. And yesterday I looked back at our website um, because I had a number of parents say, well, you aren't talking about it. And we said, and Dr. Smith started this afternoon saying, we said we would be all virtual through the first semester. It ends January 29th and we would come back and revisit in November. And if you go to our website and go to the COVID page, it clearly states it from August on that that's there. So I know that, you know, people like to surf and get information, but from a variety of sources, but I, I do believe the slides you showed today, particularly by zip code, should go on our website. And then, um, Jeff, I just wondered, um, are they talking about fall, spring, and I mean, winter, spring, and then fall? Do we have some sense? Because, you know, I know the football parents and coaches and players have been very active in their advocacy, and but, you know, winter is not conducive for them to be outside. So are we talking about starting winter sports in the spring and then fall, do you know? So the, the order of the seasons remains unchanged. We The first season with the state calendar is winter. And so the action taken by the state board was moving that start date from February 1 to December 7th of when that season can begin. Um, and then following the winter would be the fall season and then the spring season. So the new calendar provides a little bit longer seasons and the overlap, it eliminates the overlap between the seasons. Ms. Abestre. Um, Dr. Smith, I, I wanted to clarify, and maybe I've asked this before, but I'm not remembering um, the slide that shows the decrease in enrollment from the beginning days of the school year till now, it's about a thousand students that, if I'm reading it correctly, came, but then 
dropped out of the school system. We started out with about a thousand more students than we have now. Um, can you help me understand that that data? Uh, sure, absolutely. The um, if we look at that specific enrollment slide. Um, we have been losing students, so you're right. We we lost between uh, September 20th count to September 30th. We we lost um, about 900, 400, 500 students, roughly. Um, uh, excuse me, no, that's wrong. Yeah, we lost about 600 uh, plus 100, so about uh, 700 students. We actually started on September 31st, uh, on August 31st, the first day of school, even higher with that. And what happens is the number of, because of the all virtual world we're in and the disruption to everything, many of the students who left our school system, we didn't get their withdrawal papers from other school systems, private schools, other public schools, homeschooling uh, information until September. So that all started coming in and the enrollment dropped from August 31st, the first day, uh, from up, you know about 160 something down to 158, 432 by September 20th, or by, uh, by um, and then by September 30th, it had dropped to 157, 895. That's the official count day, the orange block on that slide. And then it has continued to drop. So we're actually now 3,700 K through 12 students lower than we were um, a year ago um, from, from now. But the, because September 30th is the legal count date for the state of Maryland, the one the number will be held accountable to is the number in, in the orange block on that page. And it is 2,690 students lower than one year ago on the official count date. So the, the enrollment changes all the time, but the one that drives our budgeting and our funding is that September 30th count. And as I shared yesterday, the only way that could be changed is through a legislative change in the General Assembly starting in, in January. And does that does that answer your question? If I've missed your question, let me and let is me it a combination on. of the paperwork catching up? In yeah. addition to, yes. In addition to students that came, they tried it and gave up. No. Is it both? It, it could be some students came and tried it and gave up. I would predict, and we could pull that number, and we can pull it and share that with you. If students enrolled this summer and then withdrew during the month of September, we would know that exact number. I would predict that'd be a very small number. The much larger number are those students who ended last year with us on June 15th. Their records stayed in our system all summer. And then when we started school on August 31st, they didn't sign in. And then within a few days, their, their request for records came from somewhere else. We saw about a thousand students who moved to homeschooling, about a thousand who moved to other private schools in the state of Maryland in past board meetings and other students in who moved out of state. There are really only a certain number of places they can go. And so it is the matter of the records catching up. And typically in, an, in a typical school year, those records catch up during the month of September almost completely. That is, it's been much slower this year. And at what point uh, the, do the students that Mr. Neff is working with, um, it seems like, Dr. Smith, you gave a directive to have those cases closed by the end of this month, if I remember correctly. I did. Uh, we're still about 1,000 students away from the mm -hmm. goal. So at what point do those students become drop? Dropouts? Well, uh, they're, they're not dropouts, but what they are, are missing students. And by Maryland state law at this point, they stay on our rolls until we can identify where they are. And so we'll go through the, we'll continue that process. But we're down to the point now with our, uh, as Mr. Chevanini, Mr. Neff said, eight or 900 students that are there that, you know, we don't, we don't know their location. 
we're down to that group of students. And typically we would have uh, parent community coordinators, pupil personnel workers, others going to homes and those sorts of things. We've done some of that, but in this environment, that's very difficult to do that. So you wind up with, with phone calls and asking students who live nearby, do you know what happened to Jack? Do you know why he hasn't really come back to school? And it becomes very much a, a tracing issue. And, and right now, in the next two weeks, we will try and account for everyone so that that official September 30th count with the Maryland State Department of Education will be accepted in mid-November and certified as our actual count. So that's that's kind of where we are at this point. I I was uh, you know pretty aggressive in thinking we could go from 4,500 uh, un you know students that we didn't know where they are to zero by the end of October, but we will have to get there by mid-November because the Maryland State Department of Education will not certify our account until we have accounted for every student. And so it, it becomes a very much a game of telephone where you just look for them and find them. Yeah, I just urge you to um, do everything in our power to support Mr. Neff and his team because Absolutely. I know we can get stuck with the resources that we have. So I know they're working with Health and Human Services, but I know you, you've made strides with the faith community, mm -hmm. um, our nonprofit partners, really all hands on deck to track down these students. And, and thank you for what you've done, Mr. Neff. I know this is incredibly hard work. Yeah, it's, it's taking many hours per student at this point. Ms. Wolf. I just want to thank you for the presentation. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Mr. Asante. I have no questions either. I think it's great that we're getting those um, missing numbers, those, that number down. But yeah, thank you for the presentation. Dr. Daka. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that during a regular, so-called regular year, we always have to wait till the 30th because we carry the names that have been sent to us by the other school and we keep them. We check with the teachers every day. Did this child show up? Who didn't show up? So it's a continual thing that we do even during so-called normal times. And I just wanted to comment on the county health metrics by zip code. Oh my gosh, what a surprise. Rockville and Twinbrook, the highest number, much higher than uh, Tacoma Park, which is where we thought and higher than Gaithersburg and Montgomery Village. And you ought to put those two together. And when you put those two together, it's a lot of kids that um, are out and are not getting the kind of health care that they need or they're they're getting it. So I don't know, it's just astonishing to look at that, that whole chart. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. Ms. Dixon. Um. Uh, just uh, wanted to just share that uh, I had an interview with uh, Christina from the Watkins Mill, a student uh, from the Watkins Mill um, student newspaper. And uh, she asked uh, two questions that I couldn't answer. So I thought I would ask them at the board table. So uh, Christina, if you're listening at seven at night after all this time. Um, here are your questions. And I don't know that you guys have answers to this yet, but uh, her questions uh, were, will all students have to be tested to return to school? And what precautions will be taken to keep students safe? Any thoughts about that? Have you guys, I didn't, I didn't know the answers to that. so. So the uh, testing question is one that we've been discussing at the state level. Mm -hmm. And the issue would be the number of tests needed and whether or not they would be diverted to uh, schools or not. And in our last conversation, a uh, week ago Friday, so about the 15th or so, whatever that was, the middle of October with the state superintendent, they do not at the state level have the number of testing kits needed uh, in in the state or to be able to supply those to the counties to do that level of testing. And so that 
I, I would say that's probably not going to happen um, in, in that way in terms of all of testing all students. Um, and the second question about what we would we do to keep students safe, uh, probably the most efficient way to do that for Christina would be for uh, Mr. Turner and Ms. McGuire to reach out to her and just walk through all the protocols. And I think, you know, we can certainly list them for the board today if, if Ms. McGuire and Mr. Turner, you want to give a quick overview of just kind of the kinds of things that you've been working on and procuring the supplies and making plans around those things. There, there are a lot. Yeah. So, Jack, before they do that, uh, the sort of a uh, follow up to that first question about the testing was, would they have to uh, prove somehow that they're COVID free? The, the before returning to school that has been um, used most typically has been temperature taking the temperature. Mm -hmm. Right. Been a lot but we wouldn't be taking everybody's temperature every day. Well, there's we? a lot of debate. And that's okay. been a conversation, um, you know, a lot of, of school systems started early on trying to take temperatures in at bus stops and mm. students walking oh. the building. And so we've continued to look at that and talk with the medical professionals. Um, and at this point, we're not recommending that uh, when there are no symptoms. And, you know, one of the kind of ironic things has been as it's gotten colder in some locations across the country, the school systems that started out taking temperatures have realized you can't take them at the bus stop because they're not accurate. <laughs> right. so it's, just, <laughs> it's cold. You know, you just, I, I've learned so much about this that I never right. really could imagine. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but that's, the, and certainly symptoms are a big part of what uh, Mr. Turner and Ms. McGuire have been talking about. You know, we have a very real need for, nursing services when we return students to schools. And that's going to be an important part of the conversation because our nursing services are provided by the health department. And then also the very real urgency on the part of the staff, we've been working with the state to get uh, telemedicine services provided to our families because that's critically important that those uh, health services are available and many families depend on the school for a lot of those kinds of health services. So Ms. Ms. McGuire, if you just want to give a quick rundown of the kinds of areas of work that you, you folks have been doing. Sure, thank you. Um, and so, you know, it's a really important question and I would be happy to talk more in depth if Christina would like to follow up with me, that would be fine. Um, but we definitely um, are taking a lot of safety um, measures and precautions um, to help our students and our uh, staff when students come back to school. We're certainly ordering um, very large numbers of supplies to be sure that everyone has face coverings. We'll be requiring face coverings and we'll also be providing them at school in case someone comes without one to be sure that everybody who's in the building has it. We have lots of different kinds of hand sanitizer um, on order in terms of dispensers, both dispensers at the doors, within the classrooms, um, and certainly signs reminding folks of the expectations to practice good hand washing, good hand sanitizing procedures, and face coverings at all times. Those really are the foundational health measures. Um, I know they um, people have heard them a lot, but they're really important and they are the foundation. Um, in addition to that, certainly we'll be keeping um, distance to the extent possible in the in the schools in terms of having that distance in the classroom um, and in, in the hallways, we will be um, having distance on our buses and not having full capacity riding on the buses. And in terms of your question about symptoms, um, Really, that health attestation is um, also sort of the foundational piece um, of, of folks coming back. We use that currently in terms of um, staff who may be coming into the building, and we anticipate using that with students and the broader um, staff community as well when students return. And those questions, and I think people hear these questions probably a lot of places that you go, um, do you have any symptoms associated with COVID-19? That's a fever, that's also a cough, um, other, other flu-like symptoms, um, loss of taste and smell are very important um, as in terms of indicator symptoms. Have you had any contact with anyone um, that has um, had, have you had any direct contact with anyone who has had a positive, um, uh, positive, sorry, positive 
test result for COVID-19. Apologize for tripping over that there. So those are some of the, again, really foundational questions that we ask from a health attestation. And we will be asking our community to really monitor their, their symptoms and their health exposures carefully and not come into school if they're sick. That's, again, something we're asking of our employees now if they do come into work uh, on site. And again, well, that's a very important foundational piece as we move forward. Okay, great. Thank you, Essie. I'll, I'll email her back and tell her that she's welcome to contact you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I wanna thank you also for taking us on the trip to College Gardens and we got to see how people were placed on the bus and how they would enter the building, not everybody coming in the same door. And that was, so it would be possible maybe to check uh, temperatures that way. And then the spacing in the classrooms. So experiencing that really uh, was very helpful and I, I appreciate it. Mrs. Mondrowski, you had a question? Yeah, sorry. Um, I have a, a couple questions. Um, so they can be short answers if that's okay, because I know we're getting behind, but um, but when, in reference to Ms. what Ms. Dixon was asking about the testing, um, I sent you uh, an article about saliva testing. Um, will we be getting information about that back sometime? Like how much something like that would cost the system? Or not the system necessarily, but how much it would cost to do that kind of thing? Yes, we're, we will, we're looking into that, um, okay. you know, as, as a kind of uh, way to think about this. But um, I don't know that... Uh, that's something we're gonna be able to do quickly. So I would just give that caution, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so grades, um, have we given any thought to consideration as the first marking period is wrapping up um, how grades are gonna be done? Um, will, um, I, someone asked me if high schoolers will be penalized um, if they're struggling with the distance learning and things like that um, and the making up of uh, missing work and stuff. We, we're, we're doing an analysis. We, we've started analysis on interims. We'll do an analysis when the first marking period's over and we'll take a look at all of those pieces uh, as we go forward. Um, finding the exact right balance is no small task, but we're gonna look at all those, every angle of that. Okay, thank you. Um, someone asked me about substitutes and um, why we would be having substitutes um, on a Wednesday at the high school level. Um, I didn't. I didn't know, but I can forward that information on. I can forward the email on to you guys. I just thought maybe if it was something that a lot of people were wondering about because I had not even considered that. I haven't so. heard that one before, but if you'll send it to us, we'll okay. get an answer and answer for the entire board and find out Great. ourselves what the issue is. Okay, thank you. Um, Along the lines of the of what uh, Miss McGuire was talking about, um, I've seen some stuff. Some people forwarded on to me about portable. Um, I don't think they're they're like portable air filters or whatever. Are we looking into anything like that to make our room safe? Miss McGuire. Mm -hmm. So um, it, the as I as the board is knows we have um, started and and have asked for funding from the council to um, carry out a number of improvements to our HVAC, our HVAC systems. Um, improved filters are really, again, a very important foundational piece. We are looking at um, air purifiers and air filters that may be needed in certain areas in the classrooms or in certain buildings where, again, some of those, um, those improvements may be more challenging. So that is certainly a component of our, um, of our air quality improvement approach. Okay, thank you. Um, the laptops for special education, is there a quick, um, someone had said they thought they heard that they weren't getting them all till January. I kind of thought that they were all going to be done by November. Do we, where are we with that? Mr. Chevenini? Yes, those uh, are not, are being distributed as we speak. Oh, they're certainly getting them before January. They're picking them up every day at 45 West Goody. And so I think the plan is to get them out in the, completely out in the next couple of weeks. Okay. I just want to make sure because of, with testing and stuff like that for the end of the Absolutely. marketing period again, you know, just make sure we have that. And then I think the last thing um, I had was. Just, um, Marcy, just yeah. on that same topic. And yeah. we're forging ahead to continue to 
uh, supply laptops to uh, our other teachers in an incremental basis. And the goal is to get that done, you know, this year, uh, sooner okay. rather than later. And Great. I appreciate that. Yeah. I, and I'm, I'm glad we're doing it for everyone. The special education, a lot of what I hear is concerns about like the, having the touch screen because they can't necessarily um, participate as well without it. Um, and then the last thing I just had was about, you know, we've, I've heard from a few people about photos um, with the, and maybe Mr. Asante knows something more about this, about um, photos that I guess kids used to be able to either share them or take them or if they were taking them with her. I've gotten mixed um, messages as to what the actual issue is, but about um, kids, students not being able to do photos anymore, upload photos, I guess is what it is. Are you Nick, have you heard anything? Uh, yeah, I haven't heard anything um, regarding yeah. not being able to upload photos. We'll okay. certainly check into it, though. Thank you. That's everything. Uh, Thanks. Yep. So at this time, we will go to the next item of the agenda, which is item six, consent items. If I can get a motion to um, pull them back. I'd like to pull one. Okay. It, um, can you tell us which one you want to pull? Yep. Um, number is um, 6.4. Okay. So can I get a motion to move the rest in block? Okay, <clears throat> I'd like to move item 6.2 through 6.4 in block. I second that. Um, 6.1 through 6.3? No, 6.2 through 6.4. Okay, is there, um, is there a moving and second at all in favor by a show of hands? And that is unanimous, okay. We'll have a discussion on the item that Mrs. Smodrowski wanted to pull. Thank you. So um, I, I just want to clarify that um, very supportive of the um, idea of having learning hubs. Um, I'm so, so, so concerned. I don't think I can emphasize it even possibly enough um, about how concerned I am with students um, Learn, learning loss and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and so I completely agree that we need to do everything we can to support our most vulnerable students. Um, my concern is, is that um, from the way this reads, it would essentially be going to, a, to private companies, essentially, similar to the way our uh, before and after care is set up. And I'm curious if we've considered um, using that to um, just see if there are some of our own employees who want to come in and do that um, or using the same amount of funds, for example, to um, pay like bonuses to staff who are willing to come back and um, do these in, in any number of our schools. We actually, that is the conversation we had earlier with Dr. Ashton at Burnt Mills and across all elementary schools, we are providing that opportunity now for our own staff. And uh, Dr. Wilson, does that go that does that also go across middle and high schools? Uh, that same opportunity? Yes, that same opportunity is available to all schools to provide um, some type of before or after tutoring uh, to students. And um, also, uh, we are using the money for uh, George B. Thomas uh, to also assist there. Mm -hmm. But that is being provided okay. in Smodorowski yes. at a substantial level with the intention that we will continue them. This particular money is directly from the uh, CARES tutoring grant that we received, and that grant ends uh, December 31st. And that came to us uh, in August from the state money. It was not education directed money. It was directed to the state of Maryland, and the state of Maryland redirected it to schools um, and freed it up to spend in August. And so we've been working with schools this fall to build out the programs that Dr. Ashton was talking about. So um, two clarifications. So this is not like our taxpayer school budget money. This, no, is, this is funding that we have federal, to spend on these type of things. And it must be right? spent on support to students before the end of December. Okay, I, I'm appreciative to know that. And then, um, this is only for after school, before or after care type of thing. So this isn't like an all day program. This is going to the Children's Opportunity Fund and they will work right. 
directly with um, uh, advocacy groups and uh, other organizations in the county to supply uh, learning experiences, uh, whether during the day or after school, but they will they will manage that. The county government is also supplying a comparable amount of money for the same activities. Okay, um, like I said, I'm, I'm supportive of the idea of it. I just feel like um, it would be really great if we could um, find money to encourage our, um, or support our staff to be able to go back and do the same type of thing mm -hmm. um, for us. <laughs> um, we as are, we okay. yeah. All right, thank you. I feel better about that then, thank you. So can we get a motion to move the last item in block? Oh, well, I just had a comment oh. about it. Uh, you know, this is building on it, the, some of the learning hubs that have already started. I think it's Steadwick, is it Daly? Yes. Um, Weller, Wheaton Woods or Weller Road. I, mm -hmm. And I think there were four already. And right. they are like a, a uh, in partnership with like Barty and others. Mm -hmm. It's a public-private partnership, much like the Bell program that operated for several summers uh, through the Children's Opportunity Fund. Um, and, but this is not us running these sites. I just, you know, for- I our, understand. I just was concerned about know, us spending our money. Directing it in and Dr. Smith. Yep. All right. Because I didn't want us pay, paying, you know, someone like Barty or any other, I'm not, I didn't mean to specify any one group, but any private company, if we could be doing it um, with our employees when, and the, our employees could be using the money, you know, the extra money to help support these hard times right now. If we ran a program like this, that should be school, which, you know, some would which say- Which is my point exactly, because I feel like it is school. <laughs> okay, so we will go to Mr. Asante. He has a question. Oh, my, um, my question doesn't deal with the learning hub, so I can ask it after we um, move on from this topic. I'll move 6.4. Second. Second. So actually, I'm sorry, we it was 6.1. We um, did the wrong order. We did 6.2 through 6.4 initially as a block. And so what's remaining is 6.1. So we're just going to be correct and go in order. It's 6.1. Whatever. Um, it, on my it, agenda, it reads 6.4, but I don't know that it matters. But. Okay. So mine says, um, I, I, I know, I understand. So we voted on 6.2 through 6.4. So if I can get a motion to include 6.1 with everything else, that would be great in a second. So moved. Second. All in favor with um, show of hands. Okay. And, and so now we are going to item seven on the agenda. Item seven is just um, for, is, um, can I get a motion to move? Right. I move those, I'll move 7.1 uh, closed session resolution and 7.2 of previous closed session. A second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded by a show of hands. All in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much. So we're now at 7.3, new business item, if there is any. I, I have a new business item. Uh, so um, I did want to uh, just uh, express my appreciation for the um, anti-racism audit that we are undertaking and uh, it struck me uh, that uh, we had uh, a loose end to tie up there related to um, uh, Im images and symbols. And uh, so I won't read the uh, entire resolution, which is as short as resolutions go, but I will start with the uh, last whereas. Whereas the Board of Education denounces the use of images and symbols on school property and at school activities that demean identifiable groups or may be reasonably perceived to promote hatred, intimidation, or harassment, such as nooses, swastikas, and Confederate flags as they disrupt 
the educational environment and are inconsistent with Board of Education Policy ACA. The Board of Education believes that these symbols must be banned from display in Montgomery County Public Schools, except in instances where they are being used for educational purposes. Now, therefore, be it resolved, the Board of Education hereby directs the Superintendent of Schools to review and revise Board of Education Policy ACA, Non-Discrimination, Equity, and Cultural Proficiency, and all other related policies, regulations, and handbooks to incorporate the prohibition of images and symbols that may be reasonably perceived to promote hatred, intimidation, or harassment, and resolved that MCPS make recommendations regarding such policy revisions to the Policy Management Committee no later than December 2020, and to the full board no later than February 2nd, 2021. Can I, can I second? Thank you, Nick. Is, um, is there, is, it's been, before we vote, is there any discussion? I, I would like to say I'm very supportive of this. I, I do believe we need to codify um, throughout all of our policies, our handbook, uh, you know, student rights and responsibilities. I would like to offer a suggestion, though, that you know, I'm not sure that our students go back and read our policies. They do, you know, unless they're obsessed with policy. I would like to offer that uh, we have the system develop a message to, to communicate directly with students uh, this fall or at the beginning of the second semester. You know, the issue of uh, graffiti and hate symbols was a problem when we were in the brick and mortar world. We had almost weekly incidents where reports of swastikas uh, etched into bathrooms or painted on walls, carved into desks, vandalism outside our buildings with hate speech. Um, I, I believe that we need to communicate directly with students to remind them so uh, I would like to offer an additional resolve that and resolve that the superintendent and his staff develop a direct message to be shared with students quickly. That's I'll fine. Second that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, well, did you yeah. move approval? Mm -hmm. Did we move approval? And, and what are we approving exactly? I offered that as an amendment to Ms. Uh, Dixon's resolution. It's in addition to revising policies, but it's to take an immediate action with students. Right. It's really I, I, a, an addition uh, that she's asking for that, uh, you know, uh, the superintendent uh, and uh, I guess school authorities communicate with students um, yeah. the inappropriateness of these, uh, you know, symbols. Uh, so that would be something that they can go ahead and do and uh, mm -hmm. then codify this uh, in our policy that these are uh, unacceptable. No, I think that's a great idea. I just didn't know what the protocol was. Do we have to approve the amendment separately or do we just approve the resolution? At, do we move to approve the resolution as amended? You have to vote on the amendment first. Okay. That's what I thought. Resolution is okay. amended. So it's been moved and seconded. Okay. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to, um, so Carla, yeah, Carla, Mrs. Smith, Ms. Sylvester. Yes, um, I I was wanted to ask the policy committee and the superintendent in terms of the timeline. December 2020 is weeks away. And so uh, I don't know if that's a realistic time frame. 
Uh, ACA is scheduled to come to the policy management committee anyway in December because there are some other uh, amendments that have to be made to the policy. So it aligns with that. It would be, um, it's possible if the officers uh, place it on the agenda then to bring it to the full board in February. I don't believe it would be for final action. I don't think it's doable by February, but it is doable for tentative action. It's already scheduled for a action at the policy management committee in December. We can have so, recommendations ready by the policy committee in December. Yeah, I think it's a matter of just asking Ms. Cherry to write a letter, <laughs> you know, to tell students what is expected in this vein. No, no, and, uh, yeah. In, in the first I, result, the staff have to review that policy, ACA, as well as other related policies, regulations, and handbooks. No, thank you, Ms. Silvestri, for that clarification. What we would do is review ACA and take uh, a, a work plan forward to the policy committee, because you're right, we cannot review everything in the system by the policy committee in December. That's not possible. So thank you for that clarification. And so on, on the, what we would do is review ACA and the language in it, and then provide a work plan uh, to review everything else over the subsequent uh, months. And then in creating the message, we will work with our communications staff and, and uh, television team to create a message to the students uh, per the amendment. Does that clarification help everyone? Okay, so it's been moved and seconded for the amendment, all in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous. So can, um, and so we want to move approval of the, the resolution. Right. As amended. As amended, thank you. Go a second. I didn't hear a second. 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 Okay. We moved and seconded, all in favor by a show of hands. And that is unanimous, thank you. The next Thank you, Ms. Dixon, for that item. I didn't hear you. What'd you say? I just I was saying thank you to Ms. Dixon for putting that forward. Okay. So at this time, we're item eight, which is um, it was just the informational summary, just for informational purposes. And before I ask for a motion to adjourn, um, a couple of board members text me to say that um, community members are asking, what do we have on? Um, everyone that's up in the Carver in um, CESC in Carver is participating um, in the Spirit Week. And today is where your favorite college gear. So um, we all have on our alma mater shirts, the colleges that we attended, right? Or that our kids go to currently. The kids go to, or just your favorite college overall, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. I know you all want to go home, but if we had more time, I'd let you say all your college names. <laughs> but I'm not today. No. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> yep. So I am going to um, say thank you. This is Spirit Week all week, so you may see... Um, some of us or all of us in attire to go along with the week. And just um, thank you again, this COVID-19, we just wanted to find a way to lighten it up even for everyone um, at 8.50, hungry five. So with that, if I can get a motion to adjourn. A move to adjourn. I second. It's been moved and seconded, all in favor by show of hands. And that is unanimous, okay. Make Take sure it. you vote everybody. All right. Have a good night. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye.